Okay, are we in open now? Yes, we are. Okay, good morning, everybody. So welcome to our meeting and may we have a roll call, please? Sure. James Bolton. Robert, Robert Brody. Here. Michael Cow. Here. Alex Chen. Mr. Afting, James. Present. Kareem Gongara. <laughs> Dolores Heisinger. Here. And I just lost my screen, so I might go away for a bit. It's okay. Um, Michael Iseri. Here. Larry Kaplan. Alex Lawrence. Here. Bethany Pick. Here. Vince Reyes. Here. Gach Toriaba. And um, Miss Miss Chair. Here. Okay. We have a quorum. Thank you. I'm here. I'm sorry. I had my mic off. And I, I seem to have uh, two framework. two images on on the gallery. Is that do people see that? I don't see it. Oh, good. I see I, one on of my you, screen, On my screen, I'm there twice. Because <laughs> I had a hard time logging in. Michael, so if you see I, me I, twice, I, sorry. Michael, I see he is a twin. That might explain one double image, but. <laughs> OK, so we do have closed session. On paper, it says it's scheduled for tomorrow, depending on how fast this meeting can go if we finish open at a reasonable time, we will start the closed session immediately right after, just so that everyone knows. And as noted on the agenda for today's meeting, public comments during the meeting will be limited. Members of the public wishing to comment were encouraged to submit written comments prior to the meeting to ensure that the committee would have time to consider those comments. Your written comments have been considered by the committee and will shape our discussions and deliberations here today. So we thank you for that. At this time, we're going to have public comments. We're going to call the members of the public in the order that they appear due to the number of people requesting to make comments. Let's see how many there are. Ms. Long, do you know, oh, two? We have two, uh-huh. Okay, so the public commenters will be limited to three minutes since we only have two commenters and we'll go with the first comment now. Mr. Cohn, go ahead. Thank you. I'm commenting in regards to the uh, proposed changes to the admissions rule 4.90. I noticed in the draft version that it doesn't fully reflect what was in the discussion about making it a limit of one per examination cycle uh, after an initial petition decision connected with a particular administration of the exam. My read of the proposed language in the draft rule would say that if the committee's ever decided something, then it's uh, essentially not justiciable, will be summarily denied. So it, since it doesn't make mention of the intent in the discussion about the previous exam cycles being reset, I'm worried that it could be read in the future to uh, limit it to if you've ever had something decided by the committee it's now no longer able to be revisited or you can no longer submit new evidence or address changes between exam cycles and circumstances so that is my main concern i don't think the policy reason for limiting it is unreasonable although i would suggest making allowances for discretionary appeals as volume allows for to not punish people who are following the encouragement to submit early. The second thing that I'd like to comment on is that if you're going to revise those admissions rules, 
There are other rules, particularly 4.82, 4.84, and 4.88, that I believe have some confusing, uh, uh, con contradictory language in them, and uh, sometimes internally, sometimes with the CFR code, sometimes with other issues. And so I will probably be submitting written comment as to what I think those rules should look like, uh, but uh, that will be cohesive with everything. But I, th I think the reforms to those rules probably should be broader than what you're looking at now, not to say that the policy reasoning in, in a vacuum isn't unreasonable. I think it is for the 4.90E. Uh, so that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. The next one is um, Julian Sarkar. It appears that he is offline. So we do have a third person. Okay, um, the call in user one. have to um, thank you um, 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 with many states releasing their October 2020 results this week we as applicants that took this exam in California are starkly reminded that we have anywhere from six to eight more weeks to wait for the magical date that is mid-January so not only were we dragged around by the hair for months while waiting for an exam to take place for many, an expensive and difficult period where it became painfully clear that our futures hung on the whims of NCBE, a group led by people that never had to take the bar, and the stubbornness of the Supreme Court in this committee, which refused to develop a fair exam and pathway to licensure where people did not have to buy expensive equipment. Yes, the October exam became a test where only those that could afford the equipment, only those that had proper access to email for obtaining passwords, and only those that could see tiny print on a 15-inch screen were afforded the luxury of taking an exam where the odds against passing are stacked against you before you even start. Add to this the completely unreasonable turnaround time for the majority that typically fail this exam to prepare, pay for the exorbitant high exam fee, and study to retake the exam five weeks later, how is that providing a fair path to licensure? There are many of us that took this exam for the first time in October that are not eligible for the provisional program. I was a non-traditional student that graduated in late August 2019, a little over three months shy of being eligible. So I am not afforded the same pathway as 2020 traditional students. Because a lower cut score will really only translate to an additional four to five percent maximum more passers, this still puts the overall pass rate using the last several July administrations at less than 50%. This low pass rate is a slap in the face for those of us unable to find jobs or losing our jobs, unable to pay our bills, unable to leave our homes even for an unpaid internship. With all that is not happening around us, this short turnaround time to the February exam goes from unreasonable to punitive. This committee should allow any that did not pass the October exam automatic enrollment with the fee waived into the provisional license program with the end date being the first exam administration that is back to an in-person test. Additionally, this committee should waive the exam fee for anyone brave enough to take retake in February. I put forth these suggestions because we did not get what we paid for in October, which was an in-person exam with our fees covering facility and proctor costs. I hope that this committee as the administrative arm to the justice branch of our government can deliver fairness and justice to those of us that are harmed by the stark inequities made by your own decisions. Please make the unreasonable consequences of your decisions translate into a reasonable path to a license. Thank you. Thank you. I see uh, Julian Sarkar is here. So Mr. Sarkar, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Wong. Good morning. My name is Julian Sarkar. I represent attorney applicants against the state bar regarding the California bar exam. I understand this committee intends to participate in the Blue Ribbon Commission's seemingly predetermined outcome of granting the National Conference of Bar Examiners 
a private Wisconsin corporation a contract to administer the uniform bar exam, which would replace most or all of the California bar exam. This follows this committee and the state bar granting the NCPE a contract to administer the MBE year after year. This committee has never shown justification or a good faith basis for using the MBE to protect the public or uh, whatever purpose the state bar is claiming the MBE is supposed to have uh, and doesn't even review the test materials before they're provided to applicants. Instead, the state bar and the NCBE have hired Roger Bullis for at least 38 years to blame women and minorities for the faults of the test. But the NCBE itself doesn't even have a credible basis for this, its test products uh, and the claim that it somehow protects the public. In 2013, the NCBE wrote in its own publication the address uh, to, to address some of the complaints expressed by recent bar exam takers. The bar exam is irrelevant. Complaining about the relevance of the bar exam distracts from the examinee's job, which is to pass the exam, parens. Besides, current examinees who suggest eliminating the bar exam entirely would not succeed in doing so within a window of time that is relevant to them anyway, parens. Uh, actually, that last bit is wrong because uh, many of us now have a, a stake in preventing the NCBE and the state bar from defrauding law school graduates. But Nevertheless, this business uh, has been uh, too lucrative for the state bar and the NCB to voluntarily stop. And so since then, the CEO of the NCB, who's never taken the bar exam herself, threatened to use the moral character determination process to retaliate against critics for their constitutionally protected speech against the bar exam, calling it harassment. In one sentence, the CEO of the NCB showed that she show that she did not know or respect the state or federal constitutions. She did not know the definition or, of civil or criminal harassment. And she showed that the moral character determination process serves as a vehicle for retaliating against critics' constitutionally protected activities. Nevertheless, this committee continues to contract with the NCBE, reflecting this committee's endorsements of those positions. During this time, the State Bar placed the NCBE's agent, Gregory Murphy, on both the California Attorney Practice Analysis Working Group and the Committee of the State Bar Accredited and Registered Schools, allowing the NCBE to have voting power on the future of legal education and attorney admissions in California. Instead of asking the question of whether the California bar exam serves some rational basis related to a legitimate government purpose, the Blue Ribbon Commission is going to ask the question of whether or not California should adopt the UBE. Uh, this is, and in addition to that, the, the Blue Ribbon Commission has a designated seat specifically for the NCBE to expressly and openly vote on whether or not it should be granted a very lucrative contract in defrauding law school graduates uh, on its own uh, examination that has never been shown to have uh, any validity for uh, any legitimate purpose. This is a violation of government code section 1090, uh, the, our conflict of interest laws, which prevent specifically independent contractors uh, and other companies from using government positions uh, to vote uh, on their own uh, on contracts that would benefit themselves. Section 1090 also provides that uh, individuals who aid and abet uh, those uh, those corporations or those parties uh, are also liable uh, under government code section 1090. Uh, this committee should, instead of uh, assisting the NCBE um, to grant itself a very extensive and lucrative contract, move to eliminate uh, the use of any products uh, with the NCBE and end uh, all contracts with the, with the NCBE. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sarkar. <laughs> This is no, oh, go ahead. No, no, this is concluded the uh, public comments. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the approval of the October 16th, 2020 meeting minutes. Does anyone have changes or comments that they would like to make on the minutes? Yeah, I do. Go ahead. Um, if I could share my screen, uh, let me do that. Um, I wanted to change the um, the item uh, referring to the accredited school rules in the way that's indicated here in track changes. Now, you all seeing that? Yes. There was a typo, but also um, an aspect of our motion, which was that we request the super, that the trustees reroute the public comments back to us so we could look at them and offer any additional thoughts was not included in in the minutes. And and uh, I, I understood that to be a part of the motion. So I wanted to add that. 
Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Can you please um, provide me with that inf that um, information? Yeah, I'll send the file to you. Thank you. With that, I would move approval of the minutes. But for with the revision, correct? Yes. Okay. And there was a second by Ms. Heisinger. Uh, roll call vote, please. Dr. Bolton, excuse me. Dr. Bolton, are you there? Mr. Brody? I uh, yes. Dr. I vote yes, I mean. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongara? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Peek? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Judge Toriaba? The motion passes. Thank you. And before I turn this over to Ms. Nunez, um, I just wanted to point out that recently, very recently, in fact, Ms. Agatep had to unfortunately resign from her position, and that's why she's not here today. At our next meeting, we will formally thank her for her service, but right now, obviously, thank you to Dr. Agatep to, for her service, and um, it's a huge loss. And now this meeting will be turned over to Amy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, the first item that we're gonna cover um, is uh, the key statistical indicators. Uh, those have been attached to uh, this agenda. And typically what I do for this agenda item is I highlight all applications uh, with a 15% change in either direction when compared to last year. And for this report, uh, there are uh, about five areas that have uh, experienced uh, that much of a change. The first is the general bar examination. Uh, when we look at the number of applications compared to 2019, uh, this year we had a 17.8% increase uh, uh, for the attorney examination, a 25.6% uh, uh, increase compared to last year at the same time. Uh, the other areas experiencing that much change are the uh, moral character determination extensions. So uh, we had 27% uh, compared to last year, 27% more, excuse me. MJP applications, we had 80% more this year compared to last year. Uh, the PTLS, this is a practical training of law students, 38% more uh, when compared to 2019. And lastly, uh, the Pro Hoc VJ applications. Uh, there was an increase of 33.7% more uh, this year when compared to last year. Uh, with that, um, are there any questions about uh, the key statistical indicators for this quarter? Okay, great. Uh, the next attachment um, under uh, my time is the um, 2021 schedule uh, for the January meeting. So this is uh, again scheduled to gonna be um, a Zoom meeting and a two day meeting in January um, in case we need the time. January also represents our planning meeting. So we will be discussing and revisiting the goals um, and especially the goals as they relate to the strategic plan. What, what were the dates, Amy? Um, the meeting is January, I believe 29th. Sorry, I don't have the agenda. Yeah. 29 and 30. 29 and 30. 29 and 30, yes. Okay. Um, have, I'm sorry, Amy, have we, have you sent out the list of the dates of the 2021 meetings? I'm so out of it. You know what? Um, no, you're not out of it, um, uh, Robbie. We are getting those posted now. Um, so uh, onto our website, um, somehow uh, they were posted and they were removed, but uh, we can send those out to the committee and they will be also um, accessible on our website. So that's a full 2021 schedule. So I think the you did send them out 
earlier. Um, has anything changed? Uh, no, I think if anything, we've noted the fact that, um, you know, uh, traditionally we've noted where the exam, uh, where the meetings take place, what between San Francisco and Los Angeles. We've now revised that. Uh, we're assuming that we're going to be doing conference calls through uh, June at least. Uh, so that's been that's one revision. The dates have not changed, and also the schedule has been now modified to reflect a two-day meeting rather than a one-day. So um, those modifications have been made and will be posted, and we can share it with the committee as well. Thank you, Amy. Sure. Okay. Now, we, with that, we have quite a bit of updates uh, coming from the Office of Admissions on uh, various um, uh, admissions and state bar activities. Um, and so for the first one, oh, we have a PowerPoint that um, goes uh, along with this presentation. Um, you know what? I, I could pull it up. Um, let me do that now. Let me share my screen and pull up the PowerPoint. Uh, yes. I have a sign. Oh, uh, I have asked Devin to share the okay. presentation if you like. Okay, that would uh, that works. Okay. So one of the first items we want to update is the um, a provisional licensing and um, provisional provisionally licensing uh, licensure program, and uh, Paul Kramer and Dolores will be providing an update on that as our representatives on that working group. Okay. Now, Paul, do you wanna go ahead, Dolores, or yeah, should I? I'll do the background and, and you do the, the newer information. Okay. I'll, I'll set the scene for you. So um, just as a reminder, so you get the complete picture um, in in mid-July, which wasn't that long ago, the uh, Supreme Court directed the State Bar to implement a temporary supervised provisional licensure program. So, um, so that was a, a program that needed to be created. Um, and a working group was put together uh, that included Paul and I uh, representing the committee. And had, we had several meetings and in late October, well, we, the working group finished the first part of its work um, in early October. In late October, the Supreme Court approved the State Bar new provisional licensure program for 2020 graduates. And what this program does, as you recall, is to it allows eligible 2020 law, law graduates to practice law under the supervision of, of a, uh, an attorney without having to themselves to sit for or pass the bar exam. So, um, and, and this program was developed in response to the challenges, all the challenges that were caused by the COVID pandemic so that the grads could pursue employment opportunities or get experience while waiting to sit for the bar when they uh, either felt more comfortable sitting for the bar in light of, of the COVID restrictions um, or that they felt ready to take the bar. So um, what I'd like to point out is that as uh, the statistics on the uh, slide before you show is that the program is up and running. You can see how many uh, as of December 1st, how many graduates are already actively involved in the program, 387. So um, one of the things that I'd like to go back to to point out, this was mid-July that this program was uh, deemed to be created by the Supreme Court, not, not that very many months ago. And here we are, uh, December 4th, and the program is up and running and there are nearly 400 graduates participating in the program. This I believe is, is a, a great tribute to Amy and her staff for at lightning speed to go from, to take a, a program that was conceptualized uh, in late July and is operating now. 
um, I know there, there are lots of criticisms out there in the, in the public world, and I understand the frustrations that the um, graduates are feeling in light of this pandemic, but um, you know, we're, we're really all in the same boat, and I, I feel a need to commend the staff for the wonderful job that they've done in uh, putting this program to work as quickly as they have. And that's only half the story. Paul has the rest of the story. So there are some add-ons that um, the working group is working on. Um, first, uh, it, it decided um, to open up this program to uh, bar takers from July 2015 forward who scored a 1390 or above, you know, which is the new cut score. Um, and I don't know that that recommendation has gone to the Supreme Court yet because we're, we're working on a second aspect, which is to provide a path to a full bar membership for those um, 1390 scores. Um, we met, um, I think it was last month, and decided uh, that um, if uh, those people meet all the other requirements for bar passage or for bar admission, such as moral character, taking passing the MPRE, et cetera, um, and they work um, a certain number of hours in the program, um, and we propose two alternatives for the Supreme Court's um, consideration. One is uh, 360 hours for those uh, who got their score in July 2017 or later, or 480 hours for those uh, in the uh, July 2015 to February 2017 range. Um, and then an alternative scheme was 400 hours for July 2017 and later uh, or 600 hours for July 2015 to uh, February 2017. In either case, their supervising attorney would have to certify that they possess uh, uh, the minimum competence to practice law without supervision, uh, which is not an element of the program for uh, 2020 graduates. But uh, um, don't ask me to explain the rationale for some of this because it remains unclear to me, but that is what the working group voted. Um, as far as the status of this, uh, we we commented back to Donna uh, Herskovitz um, on a draft of proposed language, and I believe that's going to go out for public comment uh, pretty soon. Um, and we may be meeting later in the um, a month right around Christmas to consider public comment. So it's gonna probably have a very short public comment period and then it would go to the Supreme Court and at what point they um, take it up and, and decide to implement it or not is, is open to question. So Amy, do you have any more details about exactly where that is in the pipeline? Um, it's my understanding that um, the uh, uh, amended rules, at least the first portion that I'm looking at um, expanding the eligibility criteria has been, um, it's either went up for public comment um, yesterday or perhaps today. Um, I have not been able to check the website before coming here uh, to this meeting. And secondly, um, the, uh, we are be, gonna be meeting this, uh, maybe if not the coming week, the week after, um, the week uh, before Christmas uh, to discuss that second component that you talked about in terms of the um, narrowing down the number of hours um, that can be used in lieu of a bar examination with, with uh, those people who meet the eligibility criteria. Okay, so the idea is after um, putting in time as a provisionally licensed lawyer, those 1390 scores could, um, assuming they meet all the other requirements, come out as uh, and be admitted to the bar as full members without retaking the bar exam. And it's a two-part uh, requirement. So it's the number of hours and also a positive um, or successful evaluation from the supervising lawyer. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, I think, all we have um, on that.
Okay, thank you. Uh, this next item is uh, just an update on the Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, so the State Bar uh, Board of Trustees approved the establishment of a joint uh, Blue Ribbon Commission on the future of the California Bar Exam. This is a partnership uh, with the California Supreme Court. Uh, that commission is charged with reviewing findings from various bar exam studies, uh, which include CAPA and the NCBE job analysis to determine the future of the bar exam, uh, looking at uh, both the format and the scope um, of that uh, of the exam. The application period closed uh, on November 30th. Uh, so the Supreme Court will be making its uh, decisions on the uh, based on the applications received and the work is scheduled to commence uh, in January. Are there any questions? Uh, hey, hey, Amy, this is, this is Robbie, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I, I think I just wanna follow up a little bit, uh, sort of, to what Dolores and Paul said. You know, I was really impressed with, uh, something that I recently got and all the, the lawyers on the commission will have gotten it. I think it was with respect to bar dues. It came before bar dues. I was just pulling it up online so I could remind myself. It talked about provisional licensing and the Blue Ribbon Commission. It went out to, I believe, every licensed lawyer in the state. I thought it was very well written thoughtful and informative. And sometimes I think we live in a little bit of a bubble here on the CBE where we receive a public comment of a variety uh, of opinions about uh, access and things. But I, I really felt that even if I was not on this committee, if I was just, you know, uh, you know uh, Jim or Jane Sixpack, uh, who was a practicing lawyer and got information about my fee bill, I felt really informed about uh, provisional licensing. In fact, I forwarded this, you know, I'm a judge in Pasadena to Sacramento to see if we could become part of that program to provide the, uh, the requirement for provisional lawyers and uh, information about the Blue Ribbon Commission. So I don't know who writes that. It had a little bit of an Amy Nunez sound. I don't know if that was you that writes that that went out to all members of the bar. But uh, again, uh, as Paul and Dolores both said, we're, we're putting these programs together so quickly. Uh, and, and you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm really not trying to gild the lily because I'm on the CBE, but uh, it, it's really impressive how we're getting out, I think, quality information about how the program is evolving and, and moving forward. So hats off to whoever is getting this public information out to members of the bar, uh, Amy, to you and your staff. Well, thanks. Oh, and you know, I'm not going to take credit for that. We have a, you know, a public information team that um, put that together. And uh, really, it's an effort to try to um, you know, put the word out there about this program. Um, you know, we've received feedback from students um, who are looking, are very eager to find these opportunities. So that was an effort for us to be able to help identify uh, supervising lawyers, because I think that's a challenge to some of the students. And as a matter of fact, um, Caroline Holmes, Audrey and I participated with Donna um, on uh, a joint effort with the California Lawyers Association uh, to explain uh, what the uh, uh, the uh, requirements are for supervising lawyers as a way of um, really getting the word out and uh, trying to find opportunities, or at least that partnership um, for uh, potential partnership for applicants that are seeking uh, supervising lawyers. And, um, and, and there were a few lawyers that were on that um, same uh, uh, simulcast that um, were uh, participating in the project and talked about the benefits at their local law offices. Um, and so, yeah, the most important thing is just trying to make sure that um, we uh, successfully uh, implement this and, um, and create that opportunity for as many students as possible or applicants. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question about, I'm sorry, I should have asked it earlier about provisional licensing. Um, is it too early uh, to have any kind of data as to 
um, you know, who is being approved and who is not being approved and, you know, what are the sort of criteria that have bubbled up as the key issues in all of this? Oh, yeah. Um, so I am, um, uh, we, we received this question um, in the past. So we presented some of this information um, at the CS bars meeting yesterday. You'll hear about that later um, at the law school council. And what we can uh, determine right now in terms of the denials, they're really related to people not meeting the eligibility criteria. Specifically, I think people have heard that there's an expansion, the potential of an expansion of the program to those that um, perhaps did not graduate, uh, were not part of the graduate this last year's graduating class, but that scored that 1390 and above and have prematurely uh, submitted applications. There are students that also um, have not uh, submitted their uh, uh, the documentation required. We need official sealed transcripts. Um, and so uh, there are a small portion of denials. Uh, the remaining, the difference in, in the statistics that you see there um, between the, those that have applied and those that also have been approved is a combination of denials as well as people who submitted an application that are not complete. Um, something's missing in the application process, uh, whether it's documentation, payment, or um, somebody just didn't finish application altogether. So you don't see any systemic issues or whatever? Not at all. Thank you. Sure. OK. All right. So um, we're on now with the October bar exam. And I think we are going to start with uh, Tammy Campbell. Good morning, everyone. So just to give you guys some numbers on how everything went with the October 2020 bar exam, we had 13,082 applicants apply for the exam. We had 9,301 that actually sat and took the entire exam. Out of that 9,301, we had 8,920 that took that exam online and 3,080, or sorry, 381 that actually sat for it in person. So we had a very large number that sat online and everything went very well. So that's a good thing to see. Uh, the video review is currently underway for all of the online applicants. Uh, we are currently reviewing 3,190 applicants that were flagged for their videos. Uh, that's across various sessions. It doesn't mean every session was flagged, but it is 3,190 applicants that we are currently reviewing. And everything is going well. And our expectation is we will be done reviewing the videos by December 18th. So um, a couple more weeks and we'll be able to say we finished the review and we'll be able to move on to the next phase of what we need to do. So uh, that's all I have for the numbers on the bar exam. Okay. And then uh, the video uh, file review, Tammy. Oh, I just gave all of that information. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, I kind of segued right into my next part. Okay. No problem. All right, and then with an update on where we're at with grading, we have uh, Christina Dole. Christina. Oh, there she is. Christina, somehow we can't hear you, right? Or is it me? Christina. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, so this has been a distinctive exam, not only because it was the first remote bar exam, but because there is a new pass score. Uh, as was mentioned earlier in July of this year, the Supreme Court lowered the, pass, uh, the passing score for the California bar exam to 1390 to be applied to the October exam and forward. Currently, the graders are finishing up the first read of the written answers. However, we have a phased grading process, which means that examinees within a 40 point uh, within 40 points of the pass line, or those with a total scaled score of 1350 to 1389 enter phase two. And all of their six written answers are read a second time by a different set of graders. 
Now, historically, a July, or in this case, a, the October exam, uh, with the number of applicants that we have, would take approximately 16 weeks to grade. However, we will be releasing results at 14 weeks, and that will be on January 15th of 2021. And that is my update. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so I um, would like to present on uh, the post-exam survey. So um, as you may recall, in June, when we had the first online exam for the Office of Admissions, and that was with the first year law student exam, we conducted a post-exam survey to ask uh, applicants, uh, examinees about their testing experience. We uh, uh, use that as a model for um, a survey that we conducted uh, in partnership with the NCBE. And the goal was to elicit information about a range of topics. Um, and this includes things like the people's familiarity with online examination, the steps that they took to prepare for the exam administration, uh, their assessment of the utility of instructional materials that we developed with the remote administration, concerns about the remote administration and challenges that they experience with specific components of the remote exam. And this could include technology, location, uh, the utility of the mock exam and, um, and responsiveness of the uh, uh, help desk or support process. So again, the goal was to gather as much information as a means of improving uh, the remote testing experience on future exams. So um, can we go to the next slide, please? So um, the survey was sent to all 9,615 uh, uh, examinees who, set, who registered for the remote exam. And we, heard, uh, we received responses from over half. So 5,305 uh, provided a response, uh, which yielded a 55% uh, response rate. What we learned is that um, it's clear that test takers were under extraordinary stress for this administration of the exam. Uh, the pressure of the pandemic and the short timeline available to adjust and prepare for the remote exam were reflected in a number of survey results. Um, almost six out of 10 respondents, so 59%, expressed moderate or extreme concern over having to take an exam in any manner uh, during the pandemic. However, despite this anxiety, when asked how they would prefer to take the bar exam if they had to sit for it again, Respondents reported as follows, um, and as you see there, almost two thirds, so 63% uh, reported preferring to take it online in an isolated environment, which uh, could include home or a hotel as some have uh, took the exam. Another 25% preferred to take it on the computer in a group setting, such as a school or at a test center. Uh, while only 6% preferred taking the exam in some other fashion other than a computer, so most likely in the traditional format of, of an in-person exam. Also over half, 57% reported that they were satisfied with remote testing, uh, while 28% uh, reported some level of dissatisfaction. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, as for technical issues uh, that were experienced, um, uh, uh, prior to the day of the exam, uh, applicants were required to conduct a, a mock exam. The goal of that mock exam was to mimic what was going to happen on the exam day. Um, and this is uh, just the logistics uh, in regard to the system. So the mock exam uh, required that people access the uh, uh, password process, um, the implementation and use of that password, as well as the exam features um, in each of the question types, whether that was a multiple choice question, essay or a PT uh, were included in that, in that uh, mock exam. So about one in five uh, students, 22% experienced, uh, reported having technical issues with the mock exam. And of those, of the 22%, more than half reported that it took them more than 45 minutes to resolve technical issues during the mock exam. One of the things that was reported to us also from ExamSoft was that if people were successful on the mock exam, that uh, the success rate for the actual exam uh, was 
uh, would be reflected. So if you could successfully take the mock exam, you should not experience any problems at the, at the exam. And perhaps that is the case because on exam day, only 15% of respondents reported having technical issues. ExamSoft also conducted uh, analysis on the data they were collecting. And this included call records and um, primarily call records uh, that they kept um, as calls were coming into their call center. And their figures indicate that the company was contacted just uh, by just over 8% of exam takers and that the company was able to successfully resolve over 80% of these inquiries. Um, so we are looking at this data to look at methods for improving. And there are three areas that we're gonna focus on, um, instructional material and the timeliness of those instructions. We've already started that. Um, if you look at our website, our, the, our FAQs are up for the February 2021 exam that we know is gonna be uh, administered online. Uh, we also have shared the testing conditions um, as soon as possible. So they were all delivered to people who've applied so far. And you'll hear about that in Audrey's report. And we also are working with ExamSoft to ensure that features that um, are gonna be available for the actual exam are also available in the mock exam. Now, I talked about the fact that uh, we have this uh, data set. It's a rich data set. And we're developing a summary of findings that is going to be available in a publication that we'll be putting on our website. So these are some of the survey highlights, but there's definitely more data out there and it is forthcoming. Are there any questions? Yeah, uh, I have a question, Amy. Yes. I can't do the math in my head, but uh, <laughs> For the, uh, your second uh, bullet there, 15% of respondents had technical difficulties, but that was only 8% and then they resolved 80%. What happens to those that don't get resolved? What, what sort of problems were there? Were, did, and do people get to like take those sections over or it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't that serious of a problem? Um, you know, I... Uh... I can't really uh, describe what happened with people who were not successful. What I can tell you is of everybody who started the exam, and we have this breakdown for um, all of the, uh, every single question, whether it's an essay, MBE, or the PT, of people who started on average 97.3 um, uploaded an exam file. So the success rate was pretty high, that remaining, you know, uh, 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 group, I think it's like 2.7% um, are pr probably people who weren't able to sub uh, upload an exam file. So it's a small proportion, uh, but it's still uh, something that we want to be able to address. One of the things that we did um, during the exam, and uh, maybe um, uh, Audrey could speak to this, is there was a, an, a Zoom room that was established but with ExamSoft. So we were live uh, interacting with ExamSoft um, throughout the entire exam uh, administration. And in that process, we could uh, immediately respond to needs that were coming up. So one of the first things is, as you may recall, is that everybody had about a 15 minute window in the event that they were having issues, a 15 minute, 15 minute window for uh, when the password was active uh, through the Zoom room, we were able to increase that time to avoid these situations. And so, um, you know, if it was a matter of having accessibility so that um, somebody, you know, could access a, a, a password, let's say around 1130, um, 1145 when the cutoff was at 1130, we allowed for that um, just to help resolve and reduce uh, some of these problems. Um, so for the most part, I think the uh, problems that ex uh, persisted were primarily laptop issues. Wow. Um, I just want to uh, extend Robbie's uh, accolades uh, to you to this section also. I know this is a lot of detail, so we're just getting a glimpse of, you know, some of these behind the scenes, and it's really a lot. So uh, thank you for all that. Oh, yeah, and it's I. We have a great team <laughs> um, that is uh, spearheading a lot of these initiatives. So you know, um, it's definitely a, a, a team effort here. Okay. I, I have a question. Okay. I have a question uh, next. Okay. Um. So this might be really another top discussion. Um. But have you started to? It's obvious. This, these are very positive um, results. 
it's obvious that um, probably like the, the rest of the world, we're going to be moving more and more towards maybe a hybrid remote uh, in-person exam, you know, for over the long run. Um, have you started to look at long term how that plays out, especially in regards to um, cost? Well, um, I think there's a lot um, that we can uh, be looking at. I mean, this is um, this is a post-exam survey and the information that we have in terms of, um, you know, the uh, ratio of people who took uh, registered for the exam and those that completed it um, is a rich data set in, in terms of um, what we can be looking at. Um, but we are focused right now on completing um, this exam cycle um, between um, and, and preparing for the next one. But, you know, we're going to continue con uh, collecting this information uh, because I think it'll be interest of everyone um, uh, in terms of uh, what the future of the bar exam is. I mean, this could even shed light on some of the BRC information that, um, you know, for the BRC, the, sorry, Blue Ribbon Commission. Um, but, you know, I think your question, Larry, was, um, are we collecting this for um, decision making on the future of the bar exam? And we are. Um, this is our first data set, and we'll continue to do this um, for our, the remaining exams that we are going to be conducting. Were there any cost different, notable cost differentials? For example, you didn't have to rent a lot of big, you know, convention center rooms and that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, we um, have not been able to conduct that analysis yet. We always bring it to the committee, but part of it is also how long it takes us to get our invoices. So we, this exam happened in October. It usually takes a couple of months for all of the invoices to come in. Um, and so we're in the process. We will be bringing that to the committee, but we did bring that and um, demonstrated a cost savings uh, with the first year exam. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Amy, I know this is too soon to um, request, but I just wanted to hopefully um, provide some additional like inquiry where I'm, I'm interested to see like the equity issues because I know um, there was 20% of those who um, didn't get their um, issues resolved. And so I'm interested to understand uh, what type of uh, participant that was and also identifying what are um, some equity issues we're seeing in the remote bar administration. This was one of, one of the more bigger critiques as a, you know, in regard to tech and in regard to um, people's access to uh, the, the, the things they needed to be successful in this test. But I, I think that'll be, um, we'll, we'll learn more once we get the exam results. But I think um, in the past, we've waited probably like two to three years to do, not two to three years, maybe a year or two to do examinations. Like when we went from a three to two day and we analyzed the impact of that as well. We're, I think we even have a report today studying that, um, the financial impact. But I, I know it's too soon to tell, but, but um, if that could be something that we um, really hone in on, um, that would be helpful. Okay, thanks Kareem. Well, and, and, and you know, uh, there's two different ways that um, we can look at this information to um, address some of the equity concerns. I mean, we um, anticipated, um, you know, uh, the potential for this when we offered um, applicants the ability uh, with extenuating circumstances to take the exam in person. Um, some of the um, statistics that were shared as to who came to the exam, like how many people were in person and how many people were uh, took this online, uh, reflected that. You know, we provided a space on site for people who did not have access to perhaps a testing environment or um, the uh, Wi-Fi uh, uh, have Wi-Fi capacity at home. Um, so what we're hoping that does is eliminate, you know, this. Um, the potential for inequity, right? Um, the other thing is, um, you know, we work with the law schools um, and uh, to try to address issues and help them support their students by providing space on site. One of the big issues that um, also was raised uh, yesterday uh, when we met with the law school council and the CS bars was this need for schools to want to provide group settings. And the concern around that is uh, the inability for the AI to differentiate 
uh, you know, uh, to really function without flagging somebody with multiple people in the room. So if we had five students in a big auditorium, that sounds ideal, especially if, uh, people kept away from the camera, but any noise or any technical issues would affect the other people testing in that same area. So we're trying to work as much as possible and address as many equity inequity issues as possible. The other issue I know that was raised um, was one about, um, you know, uh, certain uh, uh, parts of AI might limit, um, you know, uh, people with darker skin being able to get into the system, locking them out of the um, photo um, or the baseline establishment versus taking the exam in per, uh, you know, uh, at a later time. And, uh, you know, we did not um, lock anybody out of the exam when the baseline photo didn't match. When it didn't match, we did a post-exam uh, determination. We had various instances. We collected uh, pictures, um, photos of all uh, applicants outside of the system in our in our AIM system, and then we also had the baseline photo and the photo be before each essay. So we were able to establish that post-exam in the event anybody was locked out. So, um, you know, again. Uh, in terms of some of the bias or potential bias, we tried to address that early on in our design of how we uh, implemented the uh, exam. I, I appreciate that, Amy. I, I guess, um, you know, this is the, definitely the task of the Blue Ribbon Commission, but I guess on our part, we could kind of uh, get a better understanding of, you know, what, what limitations are, uh, you know, what unintentional limitations we have on diversity, access, and inclusion. And part of that, I, and, and, my, um, and my belief is, is just understanding that if there are any impacts to like, that, that we aren't seeing, and as you mentioned, um, that we're mitigating those. So I, I appreciate your, um, your report and you really uh, digging in on some of those. And uh, I know it'll be some time before we see some results uh, where we will be able to kind of dial in and get um, one of our, um, our, our researchers to really look into it. But I, I, just, I just think that that'll help us, um, especially since there's been so much discussion about diversifying the bar um, and, and the impact to communities of color. And so I think that'll be very um, helpful for us, um, you know, going into 2021. But, but thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. All right. Uh, um, any other questions about the post-exam survey? All right, well, thank you. Um, next, we have Audrey, who's gonna talk to us about the upcoming February 2021 bar exam. Yes, um, so just between our last committee of bar examiners meeting and today, we also administered the uh, first year law students exam in November, again, remotely. So we are getting more, <laughs> more and more practice at administering remote exams. Um, we did get the direction from the Supreme Court on November 19th that the February exam was going to be uh, remotely administered for most applicants. Um, all these deadlines that we have up on these slides are on the website. Um, just putting them up here so you all have some idea of the uh, upcoming milestones with the exam. Um, the final filing deadline, um, different uh, cadence of when folks can withdraw with different amounts of refunds. Obviously, uh, applicants are, you know, would like to, if they know they want to withdraw, withdrawing with, they get at least a 30% refund in the next um, couple weeks would be something they might want to note. Um, in terms of folks who just sat the October exam, uh, we are opening up applications uh, for those applicants on January 2nd. So in advance of the results being released, we uh, understand that some of the applicants who just set the exam in October still wanna apply. So if they apply um, in early January and then we release the results and they find out that they pass, they will uh, be able to get a full refund. So folks who wanna apply for various reasons um, in advance of getting the results can ap start applying on January 2nd. And then all those, uh, that same pool of immediate repeaters will have 10 business days after the release of the results to timely file. So that's a, the same statutory amount of time they always have. Um, so when we re release results, they'll have those 10 business days as well. Um, next slide. 
Uh, so some more different deadlines that are coming up a lot are tied to that final filing deadline of January 4th, uh, including when you can uh, file your testing accommodations petition, um, and then the appeals of your testing accommodations, and then for emergencies. Uh, so Amy mentioned this, but we got that direction from the court on uh, November 19th to administer the exam remotely. And obviously with all the post-exam feedback from uh, those over 5,000 applicants who set the exam. In October, we also debrief with the staff, debrief with our communications department and have a lot of feedback from law schools about um, getting out as early as possible, as much communication as possible clearly to applicants. So we actually sent out to the 2,145 applicants for the February exam this acknowledgement and acceptance of testing conditions document yesterday. So um, the one, the folks who've already applied will be able to read through what our conditions are. You know, what what does it look like to take the remote exam? What kind of minimum system requirements will I need? Um, and then they will have those options to accept all those conditions or let us know that they have extenuating circumstances, um, so that we will be able to provide uh, testing space for folks who who might need it because of their um, what their conditions are where they are taking the test at home or their Wi-Fi. So we have that same sort of process, but we're getting out in front of it a lot earlier. Um, the FAQs are up already, including a PDF of those conditions. So in case they sign it and they um, wanna make sure they reread through it, it's all up on the website. Um, if you uh, talk to applicants um, or anyone who might be listening from the public, please uh, encourage applicants to whitelist emails from the bar. I, uh, we don't wanna be in the situation where folks are missing communication from us because it goes to their spam or junk mail folders, um, which can happen. I think there's a lot of uh, more and more, uh, the settings on um, email are more uh, strict. So just make sure that emails coming from the bar are getting to you, um, that you're updating your email address um, when it changes and then if you, um, actually, if you go to the next slide, we've, act, uh, we've posted all these other deadlines up on our website as well. So we're trying to, again, get really ahead of the game, put everything out there. When, when do you need to turn in that acknowledgement form? You know, January 15th, that was on the last slide, but oh, when are the mock exams gonna open? The admittance tickets, um, the deadline for you to finish the mock exams. These are all, uh, dates that we're kind of uh, establishing in real time last uh, exam period for October, but we're able to uh, plan it out now so applicants all have a clear picture of when they're supposed to have everything done and then be able to actually download all those exam files. We also have up on the website now what the schedule is going to be. Um, so day one will be the essays and the performance test and day two will be all the MBE questions. So. Um, Whereas last time, because of the, the way the schedule worked out, we actually had the performance test as part of day two, but just so everyone knows, attorney exam takers will be sitting on day one again um, and would not need to come back for the MBE on day two. So if you wanna look at the schedule, we're also giving um, sort of going backward about how everything worked on the remote side and how test takers felt about um, getting into each answer file or each exam file. Uh, during the test, we're giving 30 minutes between um, when the password is released and when you need to be in the next session. So we've given more time. So hopefully that allows you know for any troubleshooting that an applicant might need or for their answer files and video files to actually be uploaded um, as they're taking the test to give them more time to kind of uh, get through clearing all that data out of their computers while they're taking the test that so they have more data and storage space as they're sitting the exam. So you can look at that schedule and see that we've given now 30 minutes uh, between password and time to get into the exam session. Um, plus also still each day having an hour for lunch. Um, Post-exam, these are the typical upload deadlines the day after by noon. And then uh, depending on if you have your extra time or extra days, there's different uh, upload deadlines for uh, accommodated applicants. I think that might be all from me. Any questions about the February exam? Uh, yes, I have a question, Audrey. Yeah, go for it. Um, so what is the status of like ExamSoft um, updates? My, um, I know the last go around, it was our first time 
but I believe there were some slight surprises where they had some videos that popped up that weren't originally planned or weren't originally indicated. So I guess in our communications to um, uh, examinees, do, do they are they providing like a, an agenda or a rundown of what the exam entails and what to like kind of prepare for? Because I, you know, I, I, um, I, I just could imagine that if, if you're, if something comes up differently, it kind of throws you off your, um, your, your, your game face if, if it's not what you um, expected. You mean something in the actual, um, like once they're in the software or what they had to do to update the software before? Once they're inside the software. Okay, well, yeah, and it's our hope. So one of the things that was uh, uh, not great about <laughs> how we had the mock exams for October was that they couldn't practice the performance test the way that it was actually going to be administered. So that will be different this time around. So um, applicants uh, will be able to see how the performance test will be in the software during the mock exam. Um, other than that, I'm not sure what other, what other aspects of the software were different to what they practiced. Um, there, were, there was an update that they had to do right before the exam because there was an issue identified with um, Apple devices. And so I think that was a surprise that we're now ahead of that they, um, all their subsequent updates with the software on the exam soft side um, will not allow the Apple devices to communicate to each other. But I'm, uh, our understanding is that the mock exams and, you know, there'll be two required ones and then there'll be additional optional mock exams. So the applicants will get plenty of practice and we'll put in uh, old California bar exam questions in the mock exams, again, to give them as much practice um, in a real environment as possible, that that'll all be, they'll be practicing as it will be in the actual exam. Yeah, I guess, I guess, uh, thank you for answering that. I, I, I guess for me, it's just uh, the transparency part. Mm -hmm. We're kind of like seeing that, if, I mean, that, that update was kind of a big deal, kind of understanding um, how that, how that impacted uh, the, the administration of the test or what kind of privacy protections it impacted on, on people's computers. But mm -hmm. I guess for me, it's just understanding if there's any further updates that will be provided. And then of course, understanding what updates have been made um, that are significant, um, I guess is something that would be important to, to know and kind of, you know, to reinforce the integrity of the bar exam in mm -hmm. itself. And all the uh, documents that we have up in the FAQs and in that testing conditions document lists what those minimum system requirements are going to be and what sort of operating systems for both uh, Apple and uh, Windows computers. Uh, I know one thing that they haven't um, been able to update on the ExamSoft side is that Apple computers uh, came out with a new chip processor on the, on, for Apple devices on all the brand new um, MacBooks, I believe, that they are not updated uh, to be able to run the ExamSoft software on. So that is on all those, can, I have that updated. Um, so just in case anyone for the holidays gets a brand new <laughs> Mac, they may wanna test on their older device. I, that's really good to know because I was actually, uh, well, I'm not taking the test, but I do want to purchase <laughs> a new device. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. I appreciate that. Okay. Thanks, Kareem. Any, anyone else? Um, I guess maybe just, again, moving a little bit backward, just to echo what Amy said during the exam day, um, we were in those Zoom rooms troubleshooting in real time with ExamSoft and our own call center. So I'm assuming that'll be the same again. So when, we, when issues come up for applicants, we can do things like extend the time for them to get into a session or allow them to, even in real time, we did uh, allow some folks who something happened with their exam file to re-download something and take it um, during the day. So we, that's why we were able to get to from, you know, there were people who were calling in um, with issues, but we were able to resolve a lot of those in real time. And that'll be the expectation we have again for this exam is that we will be in constant contact with ExamSoft and for our, our applicants um, troubleshooting for them as issues come up. Okay, thanks Audrey. Thank you. All right, uh, the next item um, that we're gonna update everybody on is differential item functioning. So the board directed the CBE to work with the uh, Council on Access and Fairness uh, to examine uh, the bar exam 
uh, for differential item functioning. Uh, as you may recall, differential item functioning analysis evaluates whether there are different groups perform consistently better or worse on specific questions. So this working group will be examining questions flagged as showing signs of statistically, uh, statistically uh, performance differences be, uh, for test takers across groups. And the groups that uh, were analyzed, uh, there are three primary variables, gender, race eth and ethnicity, and law school type. So uh, again, to better understand the results of the diff analysis and to uh, proactively monitor for diff in the future, it was recommended that the state bar um, convene a panel that's charged with reviewing uh, the questions flagged um, in the 2020 differential item functioning analysis, as well as to develop guidelines for minimizing the risk uh, of future differential item functioning. So. The working group is going to include two members from uh, COAF and four members from the CBE, and our first meeting date is scheduled for December 18th. Uh, any questions? Who are the four members from the CBE? Uh, so Alex Cham, Bethany Peak, uh, Dr. James Bolton, and oh my gosh, uh, Vince, right? Michael is very Oh, sorry, Michael is here. You guys, sorry, I did not make a note of that. Thank you, Michael. Yes, those are the four members. Awesome, that's a phenomenal group. Yes, thank you. All right, uh, next item. Um, I, we're gonna hear from Tara Clark. Good morning, so this is just a brief update on the Bar Exam Strategies and Stories program. So this was first offered in July of 2018 and we've offered it again in the July exams or October, which was our summer exam for this year. So this will be the first time we're offering it in February. Um, as of December 2nd, we had 225 people that had already signed up. Um, it is now available for applicants to sign up in the AIMS portal. So when they're actually registering for the bar exam, that last step, they can go ahead and register there. We're also sending out email reminders to those who have not yet registered for the program um, so they still have the opportunity to do so. Since we know folks are kind of in a limbo period right now when some are waiting for their test res results or deciding whether or not they're going to sign up for the exam, we do have two waves of the program. Um, so for those who sign up early, it will be available mid-December for them. And for those who decide to wait and sign up later, it'll be available in late January. So it still gives them a little bit of time um, before they take the exam. Any questions? Yes. Good morning, Tara. Uh, it's Kareem. Um, hope you're doing well. I am interested to see um, if we've gotten any, uh, what was the participation rate for the October exam? I don't have that yet. They're still um, analyzing the results from the October exam. Okay. Um, and one of the asks that we have for the researchers are to come and do a presentation to the CBE once that's completed. So that is forthcoming. And, and yeah, and when we did this last time, you guys did a great job of displaying who took it, who succeeded, and how it also helped in um, those applicants succeeding. And I think it's gonna be even more critically important as they understand the remote aspect and what type of strategies students utilized in this most recent administration and how that could help future administrations um, improve um, their outcomes as well. But I'm sure you guys got that down. I just wanted to, um, I was just interested, but thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. All right, next item is, uh, we have Natalie Leonard on law school engagement. Sure, um, I want to defer to Paul uh, to start this in case uh, he indicated that he wanted to make a couple of remarks here and then I will be happy to continue on. You know, I've forgotten what they were though. Um, uh, I don't think I had anything important, but uh, go ahead and I'll fill in if they come back to me. Okay, uh, perfect. So I wanted to make sure the committee knew about a number of things that were going on in the area of law school engagement. It's a pr critically important at all times, but especially now uh, to keep the law schools informed and also to receive their feedback as all of these new initiatives go forward. 
Um, the first one relates to the accredited law school rules proposal. At the last meeting, uh, the committee approved those rules and uh, to, for submission to the Board of Trustees and they uh, were submitted. The Board of Trustees approved the posting of those rules for a 60-day public comment period. Uh, they're expected to be posted next week uh, and the schools will be affirmatively inf informed uh, when that posting happens. And as public comments are received, they'll be routed back uh, through the Ed Standards Committee uh, if they are received in advance of the board's consideration. Um, in addition, this week there were two meetings, uh, the CS Bars meeting and the Law School Council, in which uh, new members were welcomed uh, for the year. Uh, they received an overview much like this one and also began to think about guidelines that might accompany accredited law school rules um, and allocation lists and how they can help in uh, producing quick uh, return of the pass fail lists. Coming up next week are two meetings uh, that will be uh, for registrars only, uh, first meeting in the morning on December 10th, second meeting law school assembly one to four, that's primarily the deans of the law schools as well as other administrators. It's a chance for them to interact with the uh, folks in the office of admissions, but also the other parts of the bar uh, working on initiatives that may affect them both to give feedback and receive feedback. This past year, we adopted a new format that we'll keep um, in this year that's designed to be a much more interactive format, even though it is on Zoom. Uh, we expect good participation. Uh, and if anyone on the committee wishes to attend, uh, you can let Kim or myself know and we'll be sure that you're added to the RSVP list. Um, you will need to be on an RSVP list to attend this meeting, um, either one, uh, and you will be able to come and go freely uh, if you like as a committee member. And then finally, uh, the Law School Dean's e-newsletter would normally be released in December, um, but in this case, because uh, so many meetings um, and action would be happening in December, uh, we'll be releasing that newsletter in January, right after the release of bar exam results. And that's, uh, that's what I have. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And, uh, and last we have, um, but not least, uh, we have Lisa Cummins on uh, exam development. Okay, so it, it's blank, my screen, but I, I just have one thing to um, remind everybody about, and that is for the um, uh, turning members of the CBE. Uh, you should have already received an um, email from me, uh, just uh, letting you know when you'll be receiving your questions. And um, the meeting for the question selection will be on December 17th, which is a Thursday at noon. I believe that um, meeting agenda is going to be posted on Monday, I think. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to remind every, uh, the attorney members of the CBE about that. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so Esther, uh, I'm done with the director's report. Um, Esther, I've got one update. Um, I looked up the comments on the provisional licensure uh, program add-on for the 1390s and they are posted and the comment deadline is December 18. Thank you. We're going to move on to examinations and that's with James Efting. I think Lisa's going to start it, aren't you, Lisa? Um, I believe the first item uh, is the rules revision. That's um, 0200. So um, basically, um, we are proposing the, uh, the rule 4.90 4 um, that has to do with appeals of uh, testing accommodations determinations. Um, be revised to uh, clarify and um, streamline um, the way we handle our appeals and um, pretty much set forth in terms of uh, there's a red line version that's an attachment to the agenda item that shows you what uh, revisions we're proposing. And um, so uh, if anybody has any questions about uh, any specifics or um, you know why we need to, to do this, um, I'm open for questions. Yeah, Kareem here, Lisa, I have a, I hope you're doing well. I have a question on this. I remember we discussed this last meeting um, and I, I wasn't very clear on what this meant. So to understand the process, I, I guess I'll try to replay it and maybe you'll, you'll help me better understand it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but but the idea is that applicants do appeal, but the issue is that w- they appeal each accommodation, and that's where they're getting multiple attempts for ac- for for consideration of the appeal. And so what this will do will consolidate those into one um, appeal to the CBE. Is that how how it's supposed to work? Well, what happens is you know there are. Um... Applicants, when they uh, apply for testing accommodations, they could apply for one, they could apply for a a whole um, slate of um, accommodations that they feel they need for the exam. So uh, an appeal is after they've received their determination as to, you know, if they're, if all all of their requests have been denied or if they've been partially denied, they get some, they they not um, get others, then they have the ability to appeal within the appeal deadlines um, of anything that they, you know, still want. And um, so then what happens is uh, staff will review the first at the first level and determine whether or not to uh, grant any of those or all of those they're requesting. And then anything that's left over that staff is um, has determined not to grant, then it goes to the committee. So um, what one of the things that was not clear was um, some applicants have um, appealed more than one time per exam and so what we want to encourage applicants to do is to you know once they get to the determination is to you know marshal all of their um, um, documentation and everything they want to do into one appeal that they get for that particular exam so you know of course if there is um, uh, if they don't if they're unsuccessful on the exam and they want to appeal or you know, for another exam, then that doesn't foreclose, um, you know, in terms of multiple uh, appeals, we're not talking about for multiple exams, we're talking about for the same administration. So if a person is granting testing accommodations, that testing accommodation is only granted for that administration, or is it for the lifetime of their administration, of their administrations until they're successful? It depends. So there's various, you know, we have a, another a more streamlined uh, procedure for an applicant who wants to ask for the exact same accommodations on a future exam. You know, they're not asking for anything new, anything different, but if they're asking for exactly what they got already, then it's, it's mainly a check the box on the next application. And then we review and most of the time, I, I mean, and that is for people who have permanent disabilities. And what I'm talking about are, you know, learning disabilities or ADHD, Um, some psychological disabilities, but not for temporary disabilities and not usually for physical, unless it's something that is a permanent physical disability. Um, So that's, you know, they do have a more streamlined process to ask for the exact same testing accommodations for the next exam, but otherwise they have to, um, if they want more for the next exam, for example, then they have to apply, uh, file a new petition. Okay, and then my last question is, I know we're changing the timing of uh, that's that's provided. So originally it said the first business day of the month, and a month, and then now it's going to say 35 days. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess for me, I'm trying to see um, if that's like, and, and and I know we get some last minute appeals and and accommodation requests, um, and I think the subcommittee on examination yeah. hears those. Um, but I'm just wondering, is, is that change because we're being inundated or is that change because of um, our processes uh, are, are becoming more streamlined or what's kind of uh, drawing out that we're having to put this much longer? Because if the test is on the first business day of the month, then that means um, if the test is administered on the 7th or 8th, then that means there, there there's time to consider it. But then if it's 35 days, now there's a, there's a big block of time that people have to prepare their documentation. Yeah, I mean, it's providing us extra time. And, and it is what does happen is a lot of times in the, in the subcompany on examinations can probably tell you um, is that a, a lot of applicants do file their uh, appeals at, at the deadline and at or near the deadline. And that does cause um, staff as well as the subcommittee to, um, you know, to have a, a lot of, of um, work at that point, because even though you have the deadline on the first of the month currently, 
um, that, you know, it, it's not a, an immediate turnaround time. I mean, we need to review, we need to send to our consultants if we need to, we need to package it up for the committee, the committee needs to review it, and then it has to be a sufficient amount of time before the exam in order to implement those accommodations at the test center. So, you know, generally we would like to have, um, or we aim for applicants to have their decisions at least a week before the exam. So when you're starting to look at the first of the month and then all the processing time that you need to do in order to get an, a decision and, and get ready for that applicant, um, you know, a week before the exam for any additional accommodations we're talking about, then it just, you know, it, it makes it pretty difficult. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you. A um, couple questions or a uh, comment to Kareem. Um, I suggested that we, we select a number of days rather than the first of the month because um, I think that was adopted when we assumed that the bar exam would always be at the end of the month, but we almost had a, an exam at the beginning of the month this year, or, or did we? Uh, I've forgotten even. Um, and so the formula didn't work uh, well for, for all the parts of the month that an exam could fall in. So a specific number of days seem more reasonable. Uh, you might quarrel with the length of this period and wanna, wanna reduce the number for instance, but, but I think that's a more um, a formula that serves us regardless of when we actually schedule a particular exam. Uh, and then Lisa, I had a question. We had a public comment this morning to the effect that it's um, it wasn't clear to the commenter that um, they could um, re-appeal uh, or re-request things that were denied with regard to a subsequent exam. So I wonder if you or Caroline could address, um, my understanding is that when you read this rule in connection with the other rules, that um, they would be allowed to, to again raise um, their request for those things that were not already granted. Is that correct? Yeah, and I, I think that I'm not sure whether the commenter had read the original uh, item that was posted or the one that was, you know, uh, subsequently posted. But I think that we may have um, uh, made the language a little more clear in subsection E. Actually, I don't think it was as clear as it could be if it had to be an E, but. Um, but my understanding is that when you read the other rules that precede it, um, they make it clear um, that um, you can reapply to attempt to obtain those things that were denied for the current exam for a subsequent exam. You just can't keep coming back to us with regard to um, the current exam. You get one, one bite at the apple, not multiple bites. Is that right, Caroline? I think it does become more clear when you read the rules together because it, the rules make clear that you have to file a petition for testing accommodations in connection, you know, prior to a subject examination that you want to take. And that um, if whatever testing accommodations are granted for that examination, you can re receive again with a more truncated process, like what Lisa was explaining. But if you want to apply for additional accommodations and you have to file a new petition for testing accommodations. So the committee will always have an opportunity to review um, any denied new testing accommodations that have not been reviewed by the committee already in connection with uh, you know, a particular administration of the exam. So, but I, I understand the, the confusion. I mean, I think it's, it's hard to just read this rule in isolation and understand that each exam administration, if you're requesting new testing accommodations, has its own petition for testing accommodations associated with it. So, um, you know, open, open to your suggestions or other members suggestions about how to make that more clear, but um, it does become more clear when you read the rest of the rules. Yeah, and, and from my final comment is that I, I do agree with the commenter that it might, there is some value in us reviewing the complete set of the rules regarding testing accommodations at some point to perhaps clarify them, streamline them. Uh, there may be some other um, cases where, or situations where we would want, would want to harmonize them with our current practices. Um, now, not obviously on today's agenda, but I think that's, that's a good future project when the 
time allows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, importantly, I think the intention is not to preclude someone from requesting accommodations that were denied in connection with a previous exam from asking for them again in connection with a future exam and having the committee review any denial associated with that. So that's, you know, that should be clear here that that's not the intention. Yeah, I, I have a follow-up if, if I may, if, if uh, Paul's finished. Um, so I, I know we heard this morning that Dr. Agatep is uh, no longer with the committee. And I don't, um, I don't know, for, for me, that was probably the most uh, critical um, expertise that I would receive from a um, standpoint of, a, of one of my colleagues. And so I know this is gonna be a big blow for me in understanding um, these, these impacts we get and the, rec and the requests that we get. Um, my thing is, what is the process for this? I mean, this might be getting away from the policy, but it also ties into the to the to the days. Because from my understanding, we would typically have the test on the 21st or the 25th within those ranges. So that was typically a 20. Um, if you looked at the first of the month, and you had 20 20 day turnaround um, to get the the approval, the documentation, and everything prepared uh, to understand the request and the appeal. But I guess for me, it's understanding. Are we expanding our, um, our, our people that we um, contract with to understand these um, accommodations? Or are we baking in the additional timeline to kind of give us more time? I, I guess for me, it's, it's like um, when it comes to having issues with disabilities and things like that, I don't like to restrict access. I like to increase access as much as possible. And I say that with the understanding that sometimes doctor and physicians get late. Um, sometimes there's impacts to um, life as well. Um, and so I just want to be mindful that 35 days might be a little bit excessive considering we used to do 20 days or 21 days, but um, I'm trying to get a little bit more clarity um, on that. Yeah, but well, it's really not a 20 or 21 day turnaround period because we have to, you know, give the applicants at least a week um, to, um, to get their decision. But um, you know, it, it is a big reason is to give staff and the committee, um, the subcommittee more time and um, a little more breathing room. Okay, is there a motion for this proposed revision? So moved. Any second? That was moved by Ms. Heisinger. Any second? Kramer. Thank you, Paul. Roll call vote, please. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Judge Brody? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pick? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Judge Toriaba? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. The motion passes. Hey, you left me off your list, Ken. Kim, oh. I vote aye. Sorry. Thank you. And examination goals, please, Jim. Uh, yes, so examination goals are on uh, agenda item 0201. Um, they just kind of list of some planned future discussions at future meetings. Um, I'm not sure anything in particular needs to be just addressed. Um, does anybody have any questions about the examination goals? Um, Without any questions, is there a motion to approve the examination goals? I will move to approve those uh, those lofty goals. Jim. Well, thank you. 
I'll second. second. Uh, who's the second? Sorry. Mr. Yes. Reyes. Thank you. Roll Thank call. You. Vote, please. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Judge Brody? Yes. Mr. Chen? Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Peek? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. And we're going to move on to operations and management. Report on the financial impact, please, Tammy and Justin. Thank you, Esther. Uh, so as we all know, back in July 2015, the State Bar's Board of Trustees approved the change in format from a three-day California Bar examination to a two-day California Bar examination. That change was, uh, the first one took place in July of 2017, where we held the first two-day exam. And as part of that uh, change in format, it had also been requested that the financial impact be evaluated in the two-day format and see how it was uh, going to possibly save some money for us over a two-year period and across four examinations that we would look at that comparison. Uh, the evaluation was intended to identify whether the conversion would actually achieve an anticipated cost savings for us. And the analysis was going to involve review of all costs associated with administering the exam and determine if that format change did indeed have any impact on the various costs, and if so, in which specific areas. Uh, there was a report that was attached to this agenda item, which is the financial impact of the modified two-day California bar examination uh, that explores the differences between the February and July examinations. And we have invited today uh, Justin Ewart, who is our controller from the Office of Finance at the State Bar, who is going to present on this report and the findings that he encountered. Justin. Thank you, Tammy. Um, let me share my screen. I have a quick PowerPoint for everyone. Um, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, good. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I will provide a brief overview of the ex uh, report. The report compared these four um, different administrations. So it was eight total administrations of the exam. This was similar to what uh, Dr. Bolas um, comparison. And that was the July 2015 to July 2017, 2016 to 2018, and then the February uh, examinations. So the key findings for the report were that the February administration achieved significantly more savings than did the July administration. Um, and this was to do that the February TA applicants remained relatively flat while the July TA applicants increased significantly. And the TA applicants increased costs in facilities, proctors, which are the two largest expenses for the exam. And so I will demonstrate that in a later slide. Um, the, the state bar will achieve or may achieve, but it, it, we're going to have an analysis later on that I heard earlier in this meeting that we're going to request of the transition to the online um, examination that will show that the state bar does achieve um, savings towards a more virtual examination. So this chart demonstrates the difference in cost between the two exams. It makes sense when you think about how much larger the July exam is than the February exam. The drop in um, the cost is much more significant, you can see, in the February exam. So this is the first exam we uh, took place is the uh, July 2015 exam to July 2017. You'll see that line it's not very significant. Whereas if you look for the February 2016 exam to the February 2018 exam, that is significant. That first line that I showed you in July, that was only $192,000 in savings. Whereas the much more significant drop from 2016 to 2018 is $445,000 in savings. 
And so you get the same thing from the 20, um, February 2017 to February 2019. You have a little bit more savings, almost 500,000 in savings, whereas you don't, it's still relatively flat when you compare the July examinations. The total savings examined in this report was about $1.3 million. So if you took the reductions in costs for all the different comparisons, the cumulative amount was 1.3 million. And that was out of about $20 million spent on the examination. So roughly 5% if you take it, look at it that way. The just, TAC, just sure. Uh, is that, um, that amount, is that for three administrations that you're talking about or how many? It's for four administrations or eight administrations, uh, but the four comparisons. Okay, what about, does it exclude the February? No, it's it's two February examinations and two July examinations. Right. Okay. So both of the February examinations saved roughly $200,000, or no, the February examinations were much more. They had $450,000 in savings and almost $500,000 in savings. Both the July examinations were roughly $200,000 in savings. And this slide shows the TA application and not all TA applicants are the same. They vary in what their accommodation is and the length of time of extra hotel time that they have, but we kind of averaged it over the four comparisons. But you can see significantly here that you have the TA te test takers in July of 2015 was slightly above 350 and then it shoots all the way up uh, to almost over 500 in the July 17 exam. And so this huge increase between um, the examination population and TA applicants for July, whereas you can see in February, it's a relatively flat line. The TA applicants do not increase significantly. And so since the TA applicants increase proctor costs, they increase facilities costs, they have significant other costs. That is why that the February examination achieves significantly more savings than did the July examination. And this is a slide of, this uh, average applicant cost is presented to the CBE. This is taken from pre previous presentations to the CBE and just shown here on one chart. So all, through, you'll see July 15 to February 19, the non-TA applicant cost is that bottom green line. It remains relatively flat. The overall line remains relatively flat, but the TA cost, you see some savings from the February 17 exam down to the seven, July 17 exam, the two-day format, but the cost per applicant, you can see it's $2,500 up here, where this is down in the $170 range. So this shows that the increased number of TA applicants will impact the cost savings from reducing to two days. So the areas of significant savings as detailed in the report are facilities. Those are the hotel convention centers, fairgrounds um, that are required for in-person examinations. The reduction in days for those larger facilities, the convention centers, they went from four days to three days because the convention, those large facilities require one day of preparation. And so it went from uh, the first day of preparation and then the two days of examination. The TA sites, previously they could be rented, the hotel rooms or um, conference rooms could be rented for up to eight days. And since the two day change, that was up to six days. And like I said, the TA population varies and it varies on the length. So not everybody's going to be testing on that sixth day. Um, and in fact, significant amount of people aren't testing on that sixth day, but TA facilities also require two days set up. So they require one day to set up uh, and then also proctor orientation on that second day. Proctors, um, the monitoring of the examinations, TAs are impacted significantly. The population will increase the, uh, increase the cost of proctors, um, but reducing the number of days reduced the number of days we had to pay the proctors. And so we did see savings in the proctors expense line. Grading, the expenses related to the preparation and grading of the examinations, there was one less, um, there were two less questions for grading, so that required less graders, and each grader is provided a preparation fee, and so having less graders meant that there was less preparation fees, and each grader is paid 
uh, per answer file. And so the reduction in the number of answer files needed um, resulted in some significant cost savings. And then also areas of printing, having to print two less um, questions did have some significant savings, but a more significant savings was uh, renegotiation, renegotiation of these contracts. And so the contract costs came down and the contracts were renegotiated twice over the four different um, administrations looked at. And this is, uh, I wanted to provide a sample from the report that demonstrates the impact of the TA population. The costs um, are significant. You see it's 650,000 if you look at the proctors, if you take the TA and non-TA costs, so that's 650,000. And the reduction to the two-day format, you see the slope on both TA and non-TA is similar. And so we have similar reductions. It's about $50,000 savings in the TA line and $50,000 savings in the non-TA line. If you look at the July administration, which had significantly more TA applicants, the proctor cost for the TA does not decline like the February, but it actually goes up and we spend more on proctor costs than we did in the three-day examination. That's because of the significant increase in that population. And so the future of the examination, we will do future studies of the transition to the online examination. As you heard, there was about 300 in-person people at the October administration and reducing the in-person applicant population obviously will have a significant impact on the future examinations. And um, continuing having this a successful online examination has long-term impact on savings and could reduce the costs that examinees may need to pay in order to take the examination. So there is my brief slideshow um, for anybody. I'm now going to open it up to questions. Just, Justin, this is Donna. Before before uh, we move on to questions, I just wanted to clarify one thing um, for the committee members. Um, when we look at things like what's the total cost per applicant, um, there's a big factor that's missing in that. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page on that. Um, the staff of the Office of Admissions is funded um, uh, by the various fees that are charged. It's a self-funded um, uh, office. So, um, you know, moral character staff uh, in part is funded by the, the moral character fees, application fees. Um, so the staff of the Office of Admission is funded uh, uh, to do the work to prepare for these bar exams is funded year round by these bar exam fees. And so what's not included in this, what the cost is per applicant is all of the staff costs that go in year round to determining eligibility um, 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 and sort of everything else that's not funded by some other fee um, that, is in, that is a part and parcel of us administering the bar exam. That's a key part of the cost of putting on the exam. And therefore that's a part of what's funded by the, um, by the fees that we charge. And, and, um, and I just didn't want sort of the, the data to be uh, the data could be a little bit misleading without that characterization um, because you have sort of a, a, a sense of what the average cost of the exam is. And it is really considerably more than that when you take into account all of the staff work that gets put into contracting for the facilities, determining eligibility, um, you know, getting the transcripts from the law school, sort of all of the pieces that are involved. And so I just wanted to add that, that additional piece of context. Right. Thank you, Donna. I, for, I forgot to mention that. And in the report, I do say that we don't track the costs specifically to each examination, but everybody in admissions directly or indirectly supports those examinations. And the example I gave was the indirect costs and personnel costs in 2018 admissions budget was about $14 million. And so if you just say that only half of those costs are attributed to the February and July examinations, that's still seven point you know, one million, seven million dollars, and the cost that we were talking about in the exam is only five million dollars. So the the personnel costs are much more than these exam costs, and they do need to be factored in. It's just I wasn't able to attribute staff's time to the individual exams because they administer the February exam, the July exam, the first year exams, and then the biannual um, 
specialization exam. And uh, hey, this is uh, Robbie and Donna. Maybe this comment or question is best directed to you. Uh, I guess I wanted to highlight. I I think that these savings, if there are any, we'd have to view as temporary. Uh, assuming that there is a vaccine coming in the new year and the, the pandemic is coming to an end, I'm assuming that all things being equal, the bar would prefer that we administer the bar exam in whatever form it's going to be in the future in the way that we've done it in the past in a controlled environment where we uh, have better can better ensure the integrity of the exam. W would you agree, Donna, or are you looking at the future, at least from where you sit today, in, in a different way? So I, I think this is absolutely going to be the subject of on, ongoing discussions with the Supreme Court. Um, I, I think, as with everything else during the pandemic, um, we have learned a lot about what can be done remotely and what can't be done as effectively remotely. Um, and so I, I, I wouldn't, you know, right, if I were just speculating, I wouldn't be surprised if the future of the bar exam um, included some sort of more hybrid um, remote and in-person. Um, and that's literally me speculating, not having had a conversation with anybody. Um, but this will absolutely be the, the subject of ongoing discussions with the court. Um, so I think the answer though, in part, Robbie, is you're right. We don't know what, um, and I, I fully expect the remote exam itself to uh, to uh, identify savings. Um, we don't know if these are uh, temporary or not, um, and um, because the bar exam could go back to a in, uh, fully in person exam um, uh, as the pandemic is over. So it's it, it is to be to be determined. Um, but one of the reasons that I did want to also mention the admissions costs the staffing function um, as we're looking at the cost of administering the bar exam per applicant is that one of the things that uh, that uh, Amy and and I have been talking about is um, the need to do a little a little right sizing of the office of admissions I think we could benefit from you know an additional and I don't know the numbers but you know let's just say an additional person in eligibility in um, in you know a couple of our different units with a, a testing accommodations across the bar, so we can um, eliminate some of the we can reduce the timelines of processing um, the matters and um, and be able to be more responsive to the applicants as they are reaching out to us as a bar exam is coming up upon us. Um, so I think we're we're going to want to do that um, no matter what is add some additional staff to to the office, which would which would ultimately increase the, the overall staffing part of the costs if we have a decrease attributable to any sort of ongoing um, uh, remote exam or certainly the, the decreases that Justin pointed out, pointed to with a two day exam, um, those would could offset some of those increased staffing costs. Um, so Donna then, again, and now I'm gonna, reverse myself and say in the very short term, would your answer to those that say, well, in the short term for the next exam, because it is remote and you're not renting facilities, you should be charging less for the exam uh, on its face. That sounds like an, an argument that could be made. Would your answer be no, that's not true because at the end of the day, our costs are the same or yes, let's charge $100 less because at the end of the day, our, our overall costs are, are less. So I think that goes to the point that Amy was making earlier, which is we can't fully categorize yet the overall cost of administering the remote exam. Um, it includes things not not things like you know the, the facilities that that we um, that we use for the exam. Not only those, but things like the um, um, the proctors that we have. Uh, right, we had to hire uh, less proctors um, to administer the the exam. Um, uh, but we have to hire proctors now for the review of the videos. 
um, uh, that were generated during the exams. And so getting a sense of how that um, pencils out in the end is something that we just haven't had the opportunity to do yet. So I don't know that we'll be in a position um, to, to say that, that their cost for the February exam should be reduced by X dollars. I just don't think we have, the, we have the data yet. It's something that we will be working as expeditiously as possible to get our arms around. Um, but, um, but, you know, with that, plus the, the, um, sort of additional sort of staff resources, um, we, you know, I, I just don't think we're going to be in a position, uh, immediately to make that call. And I do want to highlight one thing also in response to that, and that is that some costs, um, are not going away, uh, regardless of the administration, you know, whether, uh, whether, whether it's online or in person, for example, um, the report specifies this, um, Justin included the TA consultants as an example. Um, you know, the TA consultants, um, if anything, those costs are going up, not because we're paying more, but because there's a greater need, you know, there's, uh, the TA process itself has not changed um, aside from the volume of applications that we're getting, which means that we need more access to TA consultants. And um, in the reports that we've typically brought to the committee on the cost of the exam, those costs have not have never been incorporated, um, which is why Justin's report is more comprehensive. It, um, it factored uh, some of that in there too. So I just wanna highlight that despite the modality um, that those TA costs are gonna be ongoing from one exam to the next. Yeah, th thanks Amy, I, I had forgotten that point, which is, a, which is an incredibly important point. So part of the, the costs of administering the exam haven't, other parts of it haven't been factored in, um, in what we are, what we present to the committee. And so it doesn't, it doesn't give a full um, example, uh, a, 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 an under, full understanding of what the administration per, uh, per examinee is. Okay, and this is Robbie again, and I, you know, Amy, of course, you know, I don't doubt any of that, but there is that sentiment out there that uh, I think we need to either uh, acknowledge it uh, or, you know, be ready with facts and figures that, you know, that all the things that we're talking about are fixed costs from bar to bar, our staffing and and this and that. Uh, I know there are added costs with our new exam soft and review of the tapes and, and stuff, but I think, you know, uh, as Tammy will, will highlight the significant cost that we don't have with our facilities and our many, many proctors at each site, you know, if there's a savings there in the very short term for the exam that's coming up, then, uh, you know, it, it, it's something to either talk about or address uh, to our applicants so they understand why the price is the same or or is it? You, you oh, know. Robbie, uh, you know, it, it is something that we've discussed internally, but I think we need more than one exam. Um, you know, this is our first, you know, I'm gonna use air quotes, July exam, you know, right. it happened yeah. in October. And we also had, uh, this is gonna be our first February exam. And so we, you know, uh, you can see in this report, it took four exam cycles to really get a sense of what the trend is when it comes to the cost uh, expenditure and savings. And so, um, but it is something that we need to look at. Um, can uh, moving the modality to um, an online exam lead to cost savings in the um, price of uh, the bar exam? Um, it's definitely something that we we're keeping our eyes on as well. Okay, great. I, thank you. If I could just mention one thing too, is that if, you know, regardless of how long the online exam continues, let's say it did continue past the, post the pandemic, you know, there are additional costs and changes to how we administer an exam for in-person based on the pandemic. So if the pandemic is, you know, in our past and we're moving on with the way we normally would, uh, you know, we would go back to doing things in person in the same way that we did before. So there is some comparisons there that we'll have to look at because things will change based on what we're required to do now because of the pandemic versus what we normally do when there isn't a pandemic. So I just want to mention that because PPE has definitely been a major aspect of the October exam and will be for February as well. Yes, I, and I know, uh, you know, I know that staff is uh, 
aware of all this. I just wanted to bring bring it out there and you know make sure you know everybody knows, including our our public members, that we're cognizant of these you know ongoing changes. And uh, you know I, I appreciate your comments. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you for the report. Um, on to approval of the O and M goals with Alex. Oh, Miss Chair, we need to take a motion for. O we need a motion on the report. Okay, is there a motion to approve the report? I'll, I'll move. Make, oh, I'll I'll second Dr. Bolton's motion to approve that report. Thank you, Robbie. Roll call. Um, sorry, can I correct one thing? I'm so sorry. Um, the motion is to receive and file the report. Oh, yes. I'll second Dr. Bolton's motion to receive and file that report. Roll call vote, please. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Judge Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Can you please um, unmute your mic, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Isseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pick? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Yes. Does the motion pass? Yes, the motion passes. I'm sorry, I'm having uh, difficulty with my uh, internet. So I say the motion passes. Okay, thank you. So we're going to move on to the goals. Alex? Yes. Uh, yes. But, uh, before, oh, sorry. But are we gonna take a break after the goals, Esther? We, we can, I mean, does every, I did send a. I, I think we should have a little break. Okay, well, to take a five minute break since lunch is around the corner after goals. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll just briefly mention, uh, you see the goals there listed and in 0301. And uh, for one, we just uh, accomplished one of those goals with the report. So unless anybody has any questions or comments about the goals, open it up to that. I, I, I have a question, uh, Mr. Lawrence. Um, I, and, and I actually have never asked this question, but I'm wondering, does the state bar have a hardship waiver for applicants that are going to take the test, but of course can't afford the fees? No, we don't. Sorry. No. Okay. Oh, uh, it, it also, but, um, let me just say that, um, the, the provisional licensure, um, application, um, is probably the closest to something like a, um, a waiver uh, where there is a three uh, tiered kind of um, uh, like, uh, application fee. But um, as for the first year exam or the bar exam or the registration as a law student, we do not have waivers for those. So would it be too soon? I mean, considering we just got a presentation on cost savings, would it be too soon to potentially look into a hardship program that could work on that tiered basis? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, where we landed on this based on the last presentation was that we need some time to look at um, the costs in general. I mean, it is something that uh, we could strive to do um, as we evaluate the cost, but we need more than one exam cycle per each exam. So for example, uh, this uh, bar exam was the first time that we did an online exam with the, um, what is potentially the July population. Uh, this coming February is our next one. Um, and so uh, 
you know, we, it will give us a better sense of where we're at with our cost expenditures, but it usually takes more than one exam cycle to determine that. I mean, even in this presentation, um, we got to see that um, the two waves uh, even had differences between each other. So um, it takes more than one exam to, to um, reach those types of conclusions. But um, uh, we definitely want to, if we are, are incurring a cost savings, this is something that we want to, um, you know, bring, uh, uh, trickle down to our applicants and maybe it's an over, and it could be through two means. Uh, one is the suggestion that you're making, which is a tiered like a uh, system or an overall, you know, application de cost decrease to all applicants. So it's just something that we'll have to keep our eye on. So can we put it as a part of the goal to just evaluate for 2021 um, since we'll have this administration February and then the next year's and then if we don't we could kick it down to 2022 but just yeah. that we have it on record. Uh, I mentioned that um, January's our planning meeting so we could bring that suggestion to the planning <laughs> meeting in January because that's when we revise our goals as a team. Oh, but for this um, committee would that be appropriate or in a, not appropriate at this time? Um, uh, yeah, so th this committee is going to look at the goals in January. We could add it then, Kareem. Uh, okay, I just remember in the past we've made some edits to goals, so I was just wondering oh. when the right time would do that. Okay. Alex, um, it's up to you. Do you wanna add that as a goal now? Sure, we can add it as a goal. Like I think what was said earlier is that um, you know we've we've modified um, goals. This is my first time being the chair of this particular subcommittee, but I know that um, with the other Ed standards, um, you know goals have sort of uh, morphed a little bit uh, for the right reasons, changed, et cetera, in, over time. So we can add it. Uh, I'm sorry, Alex. The added goal would be to look at the idea of a tiered fee structure based on need is was that the idea well i, I think you know uh, <laughs> cream should make the motion to add that goal in state uh, what, what was your idea mr gongora so definitely uh with hearing amy's commentary uh to evaluate a tiered um hardship program for um first year law exam and uh bar applicants um maybe aligned with the provisional license tiered um, fee waiver program. Uh, but, but just that if there's cost savings, then we should probably loop that into um, a way that we could increase access to the bar and, and offset some of the cost. Yeah, it, 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 I think Amy was using the provisional licensure program as an example, but um, the categories wouldn't work um, uh, to align that. Um, so, so, but I think that the concept is, it is is fine that we would you know the committee would want to ensure that we evaluate the um evaluate uh a um a tiered fee structure based on on need yes uh, uh okay well with the idea that we'll also be looking at uh, a tier structure based on need looking at it as one of our goals uh, I'll make that motion to approve the, the goals uh, as amended, uh, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, any I'll second. second. Who is second. that? Thank you, Mr. Brody. Laura, I believe. Okay, roll call vote, please. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Judge, Bro <clears throat> Judge Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongara? Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Oh, yes. Okay. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Ms. Pick? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. So right now it's 1114. Let's come back at 1120 for a quick break and we will resume. And chances are we're going to have a working lunch because we have a long agenda today. So just be prepared. Um, we'll have our break right now. Thank you. Hey. 
A Amy, are you still there? Oops. Yes, I'm here. Hey, hey welcome. Amy, you know, I don't, where is our new judge? Uh, he was not able to attend today, oh. Judge Herman. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I think I missed him last time, so. Yes, uh, he had a conflict that he informed us of. Okay, so I guess. I, I thought he was here. He was here uh, last time for a bit. Yeah, I, I think I missed him. So it looks like we have two openings actually then, huh? I think he was avoiding you, Mr. Brody. Yeah, well, Torres was avoiding uh, me as well, but I, I heard he showed up today. I, I don't see yeah. him anywhere. I had court but, this morning. Yeah, yeah he, <laughs> uh, Torres, he's a handful. That, that's the problem. How are you, David? I'm good. Uh, just, I'm really busy. I've been in a um, jury trial for what, three consecutive months. It's my fourth homicide of the year. Wait, so you're, uh, what What court are you in that, that's open to, uh, to Kern. three trials? Kern. I did a, uh, I tried a uh, homicide in uh, um, excuse me to interrupt. I just wanted to remind you we are in open session. Yeah, I, I think that that's that's okay. We're not going to mention any uh, names or is that okay, David? I'm I'm curious to know how your court is handling uh, jury trials in these COVID environment. Okay.
Okay. Um, it's 1120 and we are going to resume. Is everyone back? And we will be starting with educational standards with Paul Kramer and Natalie, Natalie Leonard. Okay. Um, we get started here. The first item is 0400. Uh, consideration of a response to notice of non-compliance with uh, rule 4.160 N, which is our um, minimum cumulative bar exam passage rate standard. And this one relates to John F. Kennedy School of Law. It will be followed by two others. So the, um, the foundational uh, comments I make will apply to all of them uh, with only the, the facts differing uh, a little bit. Uh, so again, these are all relate to failures to maintain the minimum cumulative bar exam passage rate, which is 40% uh, or more. That's our standard found in rule 4.160N. Failures to comply are treated under our non-compliance procedure, which is found in rule 4.170 and following. The first step in that process is the issuance of notices of non-compliance which we voted to issue in August. The schools were allowed an opportunity to respond with a demonstration that they are in compliance. Those responses came back, come back to the CBE to determine whether they are satisfactory or not. If we find the responses are unsatisfactory, we must schedule an inspection by the senior executive within 60 days. The senior executive conducts that inspection and then reports back to us at a future meeting. After reviewing those reports, we determine whether the school is in compliance or should be placed on probation or have its accreditation terminated. John F. Kennedy School of Law's NPR for this year is 39.7%. As with many schools, its NPR has recently declined. It was 48.8% in 2018 and 44.4% in 2019. Its response describes steps that it is taking or will take to improve the performance of its graduates and alumni on the bar exam. They're summarized at the bottom of page two and the top of page three of the staff report. JFK does not dispute that its NPR is below our standard. Uh, staff recommends that the committee find the response unsatisfactory and schedule the inspection. A proposed motion to that effect is found at page four of the staff report. Uh, Natalie, if you could explain um, your tentative plan uh, for the inspections, uh, should we uh, authorize those? Uh, appreciate that. Sure. Um, so uh, in line with the way that they were conducted in the past, the inspection is a little bit different for the NPR versus other areas. Normally, you're confirming something that you can see. Here, the NPR of noncompliance is actually stipulated, but it's an opportunity for the committee to better understand the plan that is in place and how the plan is working. And in particular, with this school, the school is uh, getting ready to merge with North Central University effective January and and I think it's worthy to note that their submissions now have been joint and we can see North Central University participating in the process and the Dean is here today if there are any questions. Uh, it would be the staff proposal to set an inspection as soon as possible. I understand that normally the uh, bar results from a July bar exam would be available right now, uh, but they should be available by the time the committee returns in January. Um, I would recommend uh, proceeding with the inspection rather than waiting for those results, knowing that you will see those results along with an inspection report. Uh, a change of this type uh, would be something that would generally be long term for the schools and um, though adjustments might be made based on these specific results, uh, their plan should be in place and should be subject to normal adjustments going forward and it wouldn't be a reason to delay. Uh, the other element to weigh is a public protection element. Uh, you want to get through this process to establish the plan for the school so that can be communicated not only to the public but in particular to prospective students. So when students are considering uh, this school or any other school, it's helpful for them to know uh, what the committee thinks is the appropriate plan uh, for the school. 
We can do an informal calculation, uh, particularly with this school being very close to the 40% amount. And that's something that can be included when this returns to the committee, whether that be January uh, or its subsequent meeting. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, Paul, this is Robbie. Hey, uh, I, I wanna first uh, thank you for taking the laboring oar from Alex Lawrence. I mean, uh, this is a, a weighty job and wow, uh, I'm so glad to see you've picked it up for the CBE, uh, helping Natalie out. Uh, I am prepared to make the motion do you want to? Do you want me to wait until you've done the other schools because it's very similar, or do you want to do them one at a time? Well, does anyone have a preference to wait and do all three together, or they're very similar? And I have a feeling the consensus is also going to be similar. But uh, I, I think that's appropriate. And but I have some some comments that I oh go go ahead, Mr. Uh, or Paul, go ahead, Mr. Gungora. Okay, thank you, Robbie. My only thing is, um, th we, this is kind of the ripple of the um, of the change that we saw. So I think it's going to be interesting for us to forecast, or even I mean, we can't forecast, but look at what the uh, new uh, bar exam score is going to do to the NPR, um, and 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 also looking at um, that. I guess we have three schools that are that are experiencing this. So that's a, that's a comment that I, I'm just making, just um, looking at it from the big picture. Um, on one of the schools, they received several, I, I don't know if it's this school, Natalie, but one of them's gonna be merging. And um, I think it was as a site expect, inspection. So I, it might not be a part of this three schools we want to approve. Um, but I just saw a lot of recommendations on, on um, and, and for me, uh, on this, on, I think, is it the San Francisco Law School? Uh, that's know. correct. So the merging school is is this one, JFK. Uh, San Francisco Law School is also the subject of an inspection here. And all the way along, we can consider uh, and present to you all of those circumstances. And we are continuing to track the new cut score and the PLL to be able to fold that into recommendations for you and also your discussion. I, I appreciate that. I know you're going to handle all of that. I'm, does, I'm just uh, kind of taking out of my brain because um, on, on, <laughs> on this particular school, I, I was wondering if we could get like a six month update. Um, I know we've requested that in the past of schools that have been inspected for non for, for noncompliance or for inspection. But my reasoning is that there's a series of things that they haven't updated that have been outdated for quite some time. And so I just want to make sure that we have like a six month um, status update, just to ensure they're in compliance. I do think that that is uh, already part of the recommendation and I'm glad to hear that it's endorsed uh, by you as well. In the case of JFK, uh, it's soon to be part of North Central, just to be clear, um, they had a, a, a successful inspection. Their next inspection is due in 2022. Uh, so they are in full compliance and they have addressed um, all of the recommendations that were part of their prior inspection some years ago. Okay, and, and that's because I'm missing one. I have all my PDFs open and I'm just trying to go through them. And so I couldn't identify which school is, but there was, so which school is it? Is it the San Jose one that, that I'm looking for the six month update? Uh, that would be San Francisco Law School. Okay, good. Okay, other than that, I have no other concerns. Um, that's the only school that I saw. I would like to see some um, a status update, but uh, since it's already recommended, then I, I guess uh, Mr. Robbie's Brody's motion will, will be effective. So, Paul, should I just go ahead one at a time? I mean, I can do it quickly. Well, okay, we haven't talked about, I, I just need to mention the facts with the other two first. Oh, uh, Let me do okay, that. Go, go ahead then. Well, why don't you do that? And then I'll, I'll try to craft the, my motion that's comprehensive. Okay, so Lincoln, uh, the second law school, and this is 0401 is Lincoln Law School, San Jose. Um, they've also experienced a decline in their NPR in recent years. Uh, they were at 55.4% in 2018, 44% in 2019, and this year they are at 30.9%. Um, their response attributes some of the decline to they're shifting from a mandated uh, bar preparation uh, work on, on their students' part to a student-directed regime, 
and they suspect that the students, uh, you know, not having somebody uh, riding herd on them, perhaps didn't uh, uh, achieve the same level and depth of preparation as they had in the past, and therefore their performance uh, was reduced. Um, they're returning to their mandatory program, and. If you need more details, that's again on pages two and three of the staff report. Um, they do not dispute that their NPR is currently below our standard. In their response, they request that we postpone um, our, any further action on this until we get the, um, the July, or the, rather the October 2020 bar um, results. And uh, they also suggest we should wait it as long as um, when we go back to giving the bar exam in person. Um, but our, uh, our regulation doesn't, doesn't allow for that unless we were to apply one of our waiver provisions, which really require us to find that there are extraordinary circumstances. Um, and staff does not <clears throat> recommend that we do that, but rather we go ahead, as Natalie said a few minutes ago, and uh, conduct the inspection at which we can talk with them more in more detail about their plans to improve their students' performance. Um, and uh, then decide, come back to us to decide what we wanna do uh, going forward. So again, there's a motion uh, for that. It's nearly identical to the, to the one for JFK and the one that I will speak to next at page uh, four of the staff report. The final school is the San Francisco Law School which is also the subject of an inspection report, which we'll get to after we finish these three items. Uh, that's attached, or that's item 0-402. Their NPR <clears throat> has declined from 46.2% in 2018 to 41.7% in 2019 and 36% this year. Uh, they also do not dispute the statistics or that they are uh, currently not in compliance. And they describe various measures that they are taking to uh, support and improve their students' performance as well. Um, again, staff recommends that we find that their response is unsatisfactory and we schedule the inspection. A proposed motion is found at page four of the staff report. So Robbery, if you wanna make a motion, I would, I would recommend for ease of use that you, you um, uh, move to adopt the proposed um, motions that are in the staff reports? Yes. Uh, so but first, uh, let, first, let me ask, do we have any questions about these other two schools um, before we do that? OK. OK, no questions, I guess. So go ahead. All right. So uh, I'm going to make a uh, uh, motion uh, that the responses with respect to Lincoln Law School, uh, John F. Kennedy School of Law, and San Francisco Law School to the notices of noncompliance with Rule 4.1.60 n be received and filed, and that the committee find that the responses are unsatisfactory because they do not establish the law school's compliance with said rule and further move that remote inspections be scheduled for these law schools within 60 days to determine whether or not the schools are in compliance with said rule. And if not, to allow the schools an opportunity to further explain their plans and timing to return to compliance, including the evidence upon which the plans are based. If the schools decline to, come to timely participate in an inspection, the committee will proceed with the information before it for each school. Any second? This is I'll Bethany, second I'll second it. Okay, Bethany Ooh. seconded. Roll call vote, please. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Judge Brody? Uh, yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongara? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. 
Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Peek? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item is 0403. That's the periodic inspection report of San Francisco Law School, uh, which is an accredited law school with uh, campuses now in Emeryville and San Diego. A uh, periodic inspection was partially com completed in 2017, but for various reasons, including personnel changes and a facility move, it could not be completed until this year. Uh, Heather George. George Akis is one of our consultants for these inspections. She led the inspection team, which also included uh, our committee member, Alex Chan, and Dean Mitchell Winnick of Monterey College of Law. He participated in the Emeryville portion, and Dean Robert Humphreys of Humphreys University, who participated in the San Diego portion. I want to thank all of them uh, for their efforts in uh, conducting the inspection and providing the report. Uh, the details of the inspection and the report, inspection report are um, in our staff report. Um, about 19 recommendations were made to uh, ensure compliance with our rules, and there were three optional recommendations are, that were also made by the um, inspection team. Uh, many of those were addressed to staff satisfaction, but some work does remain to be completed and due to the pandemic and staffing issues at the school, the school has not been able to meet targets that it has set for itself. Um, to assure that the work is completed, staff recommends that periodic progress reports be required by each May 15 and November 15 until the next periodic inspection is completed and that the next inspection be set for the winter of 2022. Um, a motion to that effect is found on page nine. Um, does anyone have any questions about any of the specifics of the uh, recommendations or any other aspect of this inspection? Uh, Seeing none, um, we're open to, uh, to a motion. Um, uh, Paul, uh, this is Robbie. Um, if there's no uh, for, I guess you have high hopes that this is going to happen. I'll, I'll make the motion if you do. You do, Paul? So it's condition. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I would recommend you're... adopting the motion if that's what okay. you mean. All right. If you do, then I'll make this motion that the 2020 periodic inspection report of San Francisco Law School be received and filed along with the law school's response to that report dated September 24th, 2020, and further updated and further update dated November 13th, 2020, that the school be required to provide an update as to each recommendation identified in the inspection report by May 15th and November 15th of each year until the school's next periodic inspection is completed and that the school's accreditation be continued and the next inspection set for winter 2022 unless modified by the committee's findings as, as to the school's progress related to these recommendations, the school's minimum cumulative five-year bar examination passage rate or other compliance issues. Second. Second by Mr. Lawrence. Uh, Kim? Dr. Bolton? Yes. Judge Brody? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongara? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Peek? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Um, our next item is 
Uh, action on a petition for acquiescence to a non-JD program uh, it's for the Concord Law School Executive JD um, program. It's attachment, or rather item 0404, or 0-404, I'm sorry. Um, Concord, Concord's Executive JD program is not new to us. Uh, we acquiesced to it back when it was created in 1999 when Concord was a registered law school. But Concord recently became an accredited school and it is necessary for it again to ask for our acquiescence. Um, uh, nothing has changed to the, about the program to our knowledge. Um, staff finds that it will not detract from the school's ability to maintain its accredited JD program. And that is the limit of our review. We do not approve the curriculum or other aspects of a non-JD program. Concord has committed to making the appropriate disclosures in its uh, communications. And uh, staff recommends that we renew our acquiescence. An appropriate motion is found at uh, page four of the staff report. Any uh, questions, uh, comments? Uh, Paul and Natalie, can you remind me and us, do people sign up for this program and think that this qualifies them to sit for the bar exam at first. Well, first if they read the disclosures, they wouldn't, because uh, that I, makes it clear. But um, if they don't read them, that doesn't it sound like it's a path to becoming a lawyer? As a practical matter at this school, um, I can tell you the procedure just quickly. Uh, they also have their own entrance exam that students take. And part of the way that uh, that admission is determined is that a certain score is required for the JD program and a lesser score for this program. So they will clearly be told that they have not been accepted to the JD program. They may be offered this opportunity, which is different. Uh, they explain how so, and there is a disclosure um, that they must sign that very clearly states that uh, it does not qualify them to take the bar exam. Um, so with that process, I think that it, it probably generally has been clear to the students. But you know, Paul, isn't there something about calling yourself Concord Law School that smacks of, you know, it's kind of like unauthorized practice of law that we deal with in on another committee. Do, doesn't the sound of it you know, in terms of public protection, which is kind of what we're all about on CBE. I don't know. Well, um, yeah, the name, the name may strike you as remarkably close. It, you, it <laughs> might even suggest to you that um, you, you can directly become a large law firm partner if you get this degree. Um, but um, uh, we acquiesced in the past. Um, they, they, they are required to give a disclosure. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, Natalie, any thoughts about making them rename it? Which I guess is what Robbie's getting at. Well, I just, you know, Natalie, you, I mean, I know you are, you can be, uh, you know, I know it, you require schools to toe the line, but gosh, I just think that somebody, you know, fishing around just out of the, the military or, or looking for a program to get into. Gosh, I haven't looked at their admission materials, but mm -hmm. it just seems at first blush, if I didn't know any better, I would think, wow, this is a way for me to go to law school. Well, um, I'm not certain. It might be a question for general counsel to understand what level of um, authority the committee can exercise over a name. Um, I will say that I do think there is the potential for some confusion. So for example, um, in the business school world, and Alex Lawrence may know better than I, uh, often an executive MBA um, connotes an MBA conducted for working individuals or conducted in a night program, but with the same standards and privileges. Uh, whereas here, um, executive would connote not qualifying for the same standards and privileges. Um, so I, I do think your point is well taken, um, and it is something that we could look into through council to see uh, what possibilities might be available. Natalie, if, if this is not a path to the bar, why is this before the CBE? 
prim well, primarily the ABA does this as well. Um, it's essentially an opportunity for you to um, verify that the addition of these programs doesn't detract from the JD program, that they will still be able to dis discharge their compliance responsibilities through the JD. So this is a school that also does offer a JD program. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are many of the classes the same? Uh, some of the classes are the same. Um, actually, ultimately, all of the AG, uh, EJD classes um, are similar to Concord with the um, exception of one additional prof professional ethics course. Wow. Alex Lawrence, it's what do you have to say? Are you, should I just like clamp it, clamps? Yeah, I suggest a clamp. <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> it's impossible. It's possible. I think, I think Natalie was spot on, you know, at least coming from the, the graduate business education side, there is sort of like for people who are applying to say like an executive program, there is that expectation of, you know, at a certain career level, um, even though across all of our different programs, executive, part-time, full-time, they still have sort of the same access to resources, even though the classes and the curriculum or the content is a little bit more advanced, say, for the executive versus uh, for sort of the, the junior um, participants in our program. So uh, using your words, I, I think, you know, yeah, yeah you may want to clap it, but uh, that, that's okay. my input. All right. Well, between uh, Torres and Lawrence, I'm sufficiently clamped. I'm so clamped that I'm going to make the motion. Uh, <laughs> really move. quickly, though, uh, Rob, Robbie, uh, I, I, I'm not going to offset your motion. I just want to highlight how serious those disclosures are and in informing the public. And that's kind of what I was pointing to in the previous inspections, that if the content isn't updated regularly, then it may present um, a wrong idea of, of, of uh, what could outcome from these type of degrees. So um, I, I, I hear you and I'm very, um, I mean, I don't know if we can have council look into um, disclosures and making those a bit more rigorous or, or what we could do there, but I think the disclosure process is where um, the meat is and, and kind of what you were getting to. And I can, I can chime in, Kareem, this is Ken Holloway. We, I think the issue here, which was highlighted, is that the issue before the committee is really the thumbs up, thumbs down on the acquiescence. Uh, and that's sort of where, um, the, the, I guess, the clamping discussion came in. Um, but <laughs> certainly look at, uh, we can certainly look a little further into uh, those issues with naming or with disclosures and, and where, if anywhere, uh, the, the committee can take a look uh, moving forward, um, sort of separately from that thumbs up, thumbs down on, on acquiescing to it, not influencing the JD program uh, in terms of what's before you right now. Yeah, I, I'm going to make the motion, but I, I think I would say for the future, if you're going to call yourself the Alex Chan School of Law, and you do not offer a law degree or a path to the bar exam, then that's something we, we should look at, Alex Chan. In the meantime <laughs> though, let me make this motion that Concord Law School's application or acquiescence to its executive JD program, a non-bar qualifying program be received and filed and that the request for continuing acquiescence be granted. Any second? I'll second for that. I'll second. second. Second by Mr. Torres, who clamped me. Dr. Bolton? No. Judge Brody? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Peek? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, our next item is 0405. It's a request for a one-time waiver of 
the 84 month time limit to complete JD requirements under guideline 6.5A uh, for Pacific Coast University School of Law. Um, we're speaking of the, uh, the student in question here. We call him or her just the student uh, for privacy reasons. Uh, this is a case of drop balls. Uh, the student in question began law studies in 2010. On a normal timeline, he or she would have completed studies in 2014. It's a four-year program. Uh, the student withdrew from the program in 2012 after failing a class and grieving from the recent death of one of his or her children. The student was readmitted to the program in 2016 and was awarded a JD degree in 2019, which is a 108 months after beginning studies or more than the 84 month time limit uh, that our rules require um, someone to complete their studies within. Uh, the school should have realized that a, that a waiver of the requirement was required prior to readmitting the student in 2016. They did not request a waiver until nine months before the student completed the program. Uh, for reasons that are not clear, the request was never forwarded to the committee nor did the school follow up to uh, track the progress of that request. The lack of a waiver was noticed in 2020 as the student applied to take the bar exam. Both the law school and the bar have made administrative changes to reduce the possibility of this happening again. Without this waiver, the student would have to repeat much of his or her legal education. Uh, in the past, we've granted waivers for periods uh, of as long as three years. Here, uh, two years is the request. Staff recommends that, that uh, we grant the request and there is an appropriate motion on uh, page four of the staff um, report. I'll note that in our proposed new rules, which will be going out for comments soon, uh, we would delegate these uh, waivers, uh, determination of them to the law schools themselves. Uh, we have some standards in the rules, but we would, we would not be seeing these in the future if those rules take effect. I'd so move with regard to the proposed motion. I think it, it's fair in these circumstances. This is Anthony, I'll second. Okay, did anyone have questions or comments before we vote? No okay. questions. None, Kim? Dr. Bolton? Yes. Judge Brody? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, thank you. Um, next is item O-406. Uh, um, are you seeing a share on your screens? Yes. Okay, yes. Um, I'll get to this in a minute, but uh, this is, illustrates uh, a couple of the points I'm gonna discuss. This is an action on application for accreditation of the California School of Law, which is an online distance learning, currently a registered unaccredited school now applying for accreditation. It was founded in 2005. It enrolled its first class in 2007 and had its first graduates in 2011. Um, staff has reviewed its application and finds that it substantially complies with the requirements of an accredited law school. Uh, but calling one area to our attention, which is attrition. Um, one of the standards that applies to accredited schools is rule 4.160H, which you see on the screen, um, requiring the law school not, to not admit any student who is obviously unqualified or who does not appear to have a reasonable prospect of completing the degree program. Um, and so what, uh, what staff flagged was their attrition rate between the first and subsequent years. Um, the, below the uh, rule 
excerpt. I have a table that I pulled from their uh, their online disclosure form that's posted on their website. It was updated in the last couple of days to include the 2020 column. But if you see, um, if you look at the 2017 column and you see that there were 18 first years, and you look at this, the next line in the 2018 column and you see that only there are only five second years, um, that's an attrition rate of 18 starting as first years and only five making it to the second year. You look at between 2018 and 2019, 41 first years in 2018 yielded three um, second years in 2019. Um, in 2019, 28 first years gave rise to three, again, second years in 2020. So that's, that's a pretty steep attrition rate. Um, and uh, you have to wonder at least whether or not um, that meets the standard of uh, admitting people who uh, have a reasonable prospect of completing the degree program. Now we don't resolve that today, um, but it's I, I think it's it's something that needs to be discussed with the school before they can um, move forward to the to the step of being either provisionally or fully accredited. Now, as far as process goes, um, we have uh, several options. Um, they're highlighted on page two of the staff report and I'll summarize them for you. Uh, first would be to tell the school that they don't substantially comply with the requirements and suggest that they withdraw their application. Um, they may not do that in which case, or we can also choose to schedule an inspection, which will result in a report back to us about their compliance, after which we would determine whether to provisionally or fully accredit them or to deny accreditation. Um, and we could also just call for more information and put the question over to a future meeting, or we could deny the application outright today. Um, uh, to me, uh, the, the choice between scheduling an inspection and calling for more information and putting uh, over the item uh, doesn't matter, but I don't think we achieve much by putting the item over. Um, the inspection, seems the proper place to discuss um, our concerns about their attrition rate and what what their plans are um, and how they're gonna address that and, and how for them to make a case that um, they can meet the that one standard that I've highlighted. It's also where um, uh, all of the other aspects of their compliance with our rules would be, uh, would be tested. Right now, all we have is kind of a paper demonstration that staff has reviewed on paper, but um, the um, the inspection would result in a more in-depth uh, examination of all those issues. Um, so my recommendation would be that we we go to the schedule and inspection step. It doesn't put them in the status of provisionally accredited. That's to be determined later, um, but it does move the process forward. And if they if they are going to be able to convince us that they should be provisionally accredited, um, they'll be one step further down that road. Um, again, calling for more information and putting it over would still mean that once we got all the information, we were convinced and we would still have to go through the inspection steps. So I think it would be um, just adding extra time to the process that, that wouldn't serve any particularly useful purpose in this case. Um, any questions or comments? I have a comment. Um, I, I agree with you, Paul. It, it, uh, looking at this enrollment data for three years, uh, one would get the impression that the school is operating solely on first year students. That's where they're making their money. And uh, not doing a, a service to the students who, who enroll. So, it, you know, I, I don't know how, I forgot what you said about how long they've been in existence and... Um, 2005, uh, first graduates in 2011. 
And when did this type of, of uh, trend begin? I didn't take the data all the way back to the beginning, but we can get that information. I, I can tell you a couple of quick things about the school that might give some context. Um, the first one is that these schools are allowed to admit students that meet the pre-legal requirements, but without a bachelor's degree. And this, this school uh, accepts more than most and most do not succeed after the first. Uh, this school also has a unique element, a, a, first, a capstone course in the first year and uh, it has uh, quite a deterrent effect even um, among students that have done well uh, throughout the year. Uh, and then they may um, be asked to withdraw before taking the first year. So those are two um, unique aspects of this school. Uh, prior to the school applying, um, I did have a, a conversation with them to let them know that this might be a question that the committee may have and they should include a significant amount of information um, in the application. Um, and you, they put some information, but um, probably not more than other schools would have. So I would think that this would be the trend that we're likely to see if we go back to the beginning and that can certainly be done. And registered schools are not subject to the same standards as accredited schools, correct? Right, they do have different standards. And to be clear, there's not a specific retention requirement. And in fact, um, if someone does not appear to be capable of completing the degree program, the school does have an, a responsibility to dismiss them. Um, but the school is required to have a sound admissions policy and a sound educational policy. And with this level of attrition, I wanted to bring it to the attention of the committee to determine um, if, sound, if, if sound policies would engender these results. Do, do we know that that is attrition in terms of grades or do we know that the percentage of individuals, for example, if you've got 41 coming in on 2018 and in 2019 only three so what happened to the 30 the other 38 what is the percentage of those that flunked out versus the percentage that decided that law just wasn't for them we don't have that information i presume they would um they would discuss that with us during the inspection yeah, and we do have some information. A, a thumbnail number would be about 50%. But part of what we don't know is we also see students withdraw in advance of a dismissal uh, to preserve their records. And so a withdrawal does not always connote a, tr a truly voluntary choice. So, and what type of accreditation are they seeking right now? Uh, they are currently a registered school and they hope to seek uh, possibly provisional accreditation or ideally full accreditation. Um, the other thing that this raises for the committee to think about is that this school will be required to maintain a 40% NPR and they do that at this moment. Uh, but with this, these very tiny levels of um, student population and that number being very close to 40, uh, query how, uh, what is likely to happen, um, how uh, stable is that number? or also what will happen when the first year law students exam is not a gatekeeper for this school any longer. Will this larger cohort come forward um, or not? And um, what will that do to the NPR? You may decide that that is a risk that accrues to the school, uh, but it's, it's something that's a, that's a little bit different than what you saw in the first several accreditation applications that were presented to you for the online schools. So um, I wanted to make it available for discussion. Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, Ravi. I'm ready to make a motion on 0407. Or, I'm sorry, 0406. Was there anything else? So, uh, uh, Paul, uh, I will uh, uh, make a, a motion. Hold on, I just lost the, the text uh, on the application for accreditation, hold on. This is for California School of Law, correct? Right, yes, it's that's on, correct. Yeah, it's on okay. page six. six. Yes, I'm gonna make a motion that California School of Law's application and self-study for provisional accreditation 
be received and filed that the committee determine that the law school appears to be at least substantially comply with the rules for accredited law schools and guidelines for a law school for accredited law schools that staff be directed to schedule an inspection of the school within 60 days to verify whether the law school is in substantial or full compliance with the rules for accredited law schools and guidelines for accredited law schools and that the inspection report be presented to the committee to allow for further consideration of this application. Any second? Second. Second by Mr. Torres. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Judge Brody? Yes. Dr. Cobb? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pick? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, thank you. Um, next uh, is. Actually, before you move on, Paul, I just wanted to let everyone know that we're going to take a break after item H and we'll have a 15 minute break for a working lunch meeting and we'll resume. So we're gonna do H right now, which shouldn't take too long then we'll have our break. Thanks, Paul. Okay, yeah, we'll take probably almost no time. Um, this is a regular information. This is a report on new administrative leadership at law schools, um, item 0407. Uh, this is simply an in, in, informational item that informs us of recent uh, personnel changes that are bar regulated law schools. Um, unless there are questions, there's no specific action required. Um, so do we have any questions? No questions. Okay, um, I guess we're done with that one then. Okay, so right now it's 12.07. Let's just, for time's sake, let's come back at 12.25. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, it's 12.25. I hope everyone is having a good lunch as we speak. And um, Paul, you can begin with item I. Thank you. Okay, um, also known as O-408. This is approval of the 2020-2021 ed, ed standards goals. Um, I'll just note that um, uh, some of our important next steps are the accredited rules guidelines, which we've discussed a little bit earlier. And I added um, to the list of the goals uh, reference to the possible review and updating of the registered school rules and guidelines. Um, uh, it's, I'm not sure it's something we'll be able to get to due to resource limitations, but I, I wanted to have it on our radar screen. Um, so if there are no questions, the appropriate motion is to approve the goals. Uh, so moved. I'll second that. Okay, Paul, uh, can I ask a clarifying question before we go forward? Sure. Are, um, are you wanting to clarify the text of the um, goal regarding the registered school? No, I thought what you put in there was um, alluded to it sufficiently. Okay, just wanted to confirm. Thank you. Thanks. I have a quick I'm, question too. Go ahead. Um, so, are, so do we have a system of tracking what schools have been accredited online at this time? You mean the, which are providing online education? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they're, um, well, let's see. I know there's a page on the website that I, I bookmarked recently that shows all of the ABA, California registered and California accredited schools. And it breaks out the registered schools which offer an online education, but does not do that for um, for accredited schools. Um, Natalie, do you think that would be a useful refinement? Um, that's certainly something we can look into. What's different with registered schools is that they actually commit to a category as part of their registration, whereas the accredited schools actually have um, flexibility to cross lines. So this the committee has approved three such schools, but you've also approved two more that were already accredited to offer online programs in addition to their fixed, and a third to have a hybrid. Um, so, and all are teaching online due to the pandemic. So I think it would be worthwhile to see what options could be available to bring as much clarity as possible uh, for students and the public going forward with this new uh, type of accredited school. Yeah, I so, suppose it helps um, school shoppers uh, focus their uh, efforts on the schools <laughs> that um, meet their needs. Yeah, I think the key thing for me is that when I get inquiries from uh, folks around town, I, I do look at that list, but I, I don't think it's, it showcases the online ones. And I remember we accredited one two months ago, I believe, Natalie. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, I have a very crazy mind, and so I can't remember the names. So I don't know if it's something we put in the goals or not, or if it's something that we could just do uh, recommended. Uh, but maybe if we just have that updated to show which ones are um, Cal accredited online mm -hmm. programs, and mm -hmm. then of course, the ones that are providing online services, um, I think would be very, very helpful. Okay, noted. I'd be happy to look into that. Thank you. Okay, so we had a motion, Dolores, second, uh, Dr. Cow, is that correct? Yes. Okay, um, Kim? Dr. Bolton? Yes. Judge Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? M Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Peek? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Mr. Torres? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, thank you. Um, before I turn it back to Esther, I just wanna say thank you all for your participation. Um, I hope I've provided you with the right amount of detail uh, for each of these items today. I'm kind of working through what that is. So if you wanna privately give me some feedback, if you think I'm providing too much or too little, I would appreciate that. Thanks, Esther. 
Thanks, Paul. Um, thanks for doing it so efficiently. And we're going to move on to moral character, the role of rehabilitation with David Lane. Thank you so much, Esther. I too am going to do this efficiently. Um, and Devin, uh, thank you so much uh, for bringing up the PowerPoint. Uh, I am David Lane. I am the state bar attorney in the moral character unit. Um, and in my role there, some of my primary duties are to conduct the informal conferences with moral character applicants, along with the program manager and program supervisors. Um, and additionally, I act sort of as a legal advisor uh, to the moral character unit. Uh, and I'm going to be talking today about the role that rehabilitation plays in moral character determinations. Um, and I will just briefly to give an overview of the process. Um, in California, there's a statutory requirement from the Business and Professions Code uh, that a bar applicant possess good moral character. Uh, in this context, good moral character refers to qualities that are essential to the ethical practice of law, like fairness, honesty, candor, respect for the rights of others, respect for, for the judicial process, uh, fiduciary responsibility, things of that nature. Um, the initial decision on a moral character application is made by state bar staff. If state bar staff declines to grant a positive determination to an applicant, that applicant can, can then ask the committee of bar examiners to take a look. Uh, if the committee also declines to grant a positive determination, the applicant can appeal that decision to state bar court. Uh, and then finally, uh, whichever party, uh, in this case, it would be the committee or the applicant does not prevail in state bar court, uh, that party may ask the California Supreme Court uh, to review mm -hmm. that case. And of course, that's discretionary review uh, by the court. So largely what I'm going to be talking about today, rehabilitation, the law comes from the moral character cases that have wound their way up all the way to the California Supreme Court. Uh, and the court has issued decisions in which it elaborates on the moral character requirement. Um, I should also point out the court looks to its disciplinary cases uh, also um, for relevant uh, you know, precedent um, and also reinstatement or readmission cases, cases in which an attorney has been disbarred and then uh, seeks reinstatement. So with that said, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so in California, no act of misconduct precludes admission. Uh, given a sufficient showing of rehabilitation. Um, that's the crucial caveat we're talking about today. This is not true everywhere. Um, there are other jurisdictions in the United States where, for example, if you have a felony conviction, uh, you will not be granted a positive moral character determination. It's automatically disqualifying. Um, that's not the case in California. And I sort of, tr I, I followed this, uh, this uh, legal trail all the way back in the case law to at least the 1930s uh, when the Supreme Court said in a reinstatement case uh, that reformation and regeneration are open to anyone. Um, and then over the next several decades and sort of culminating uh, around the time of the case March versus Committee of Bar Examiners in 1967, the court started to apply the rehabilitation concepts uh, specifically to moral character cases. And March was one of the first sort of seminal cases where the court uh, started to lay out uh, the law with respect to rehabilitation. Uh, oh, and uh, yeah, I, I, as a matter of interest, I'll mention that the March case, uh, that was a case in which the applicant uh, was alleged to have made uh, misrepresentations to the House uh, Un-American Activities Committee uh, with respect to his uh, membership in the Communist Party uh, and various union activities. Um, an interesting case and uh, one in which um, the, the court uh, clearly emphasized the importance um, of the First Amendment. Um, we can go to the next slide now. Um, this, uh, so the rehabilitation standard, 
Um, when an applicant submits a moral character application, if misconduct comes up, there's some acts of prior bad acts in the applicant's past, that applicant must show um, that he or she is rehabilitated. Now, this does, uh, this is sort of a term of art in this context. Like I said, the court has defined what this means. Uh, and the court has over the years used phrases like uh, somebody is no longer the same person as you know, the person who committed the misconduct. Uh, the person has had a change in outlook. Uh, it's a state of mind. Um, these are all ways of essentially saying that the court wants to ensure that an applicant currently possesses the requisite good moral character to become an attorney. Um, and so when there has been misconduct in the past, uh, the court really is, we are really looking for um, the applicant to truly understand what occurred, take responsibility for it, um, and change in such a way that they will not predictably commit further misconduct. Uh, you know, frankly, um, the moral character process uh, is essential in that we, we really want to avoid um, admitting applicants who predictably uh, in the near future will commit further acts of moral turpitude, misconduct, and end up in the disciplinary uh, system. Uh, the court emphasizes uh, one of the important aspects of rehabilitation is proportionality. That is, the more significant the misconduct, uh, the stronger the showing of rehabilitation uh, required by the applicant. Uh, now, theoretically, no matter how severe an act of misconduct is, one is still trying to achieve the same state of rehabilitation, right? Um, and, and uh, achieve such a state that one will not repeat the misconduct. Um, but since we can't get inside the minds of applicants, the court has given lots of guidance about the sort of external indicia of rehabilitation that we should take into consideration. And the court has said that the more severe or serious the misconduct in an applicant's past, the more evidence, the more of those indicia the uh, applicant must present um, to show or to meet the applicant's burden of showing uh, rehabilitation. Um, so some of the things we look at um, to decide how severe an act of misconduct is, did it involve moral turpitude? Uh, the, the, the good old moral turpitude uh, often comes up in the moral character context. Um, and misconduct that involves moral turpitude generally in this context is defined as acts, you know, for example, that involved uh, fraud, um, you know, defrauding somebody for monetary gain, um, things of that nature. Uh, and then also the category of acts that are so depraved as to shock the conscience or uh, things of that nature. So it's a fairly wide definition, um, but the court has given examples and um, sometimes they show up. We also look at uh, whether an act of misconduct was part of a pattern or was it an isolated incident? Um, was it a one-off? Did somebody have a bad day? Uh, something uh, bad happened in their life perhaps, but then they moved on and there's no other indication that they're gonna repeat it. Or, um, you know, the flip side of that coin is somebody might have what might appear as, you know, maybe a misdemeanor conviction for something that alone might not be severe. Uh, but then it turns out they have 25 uh, not so severe misdemeanor convictions in the past several years or something. That would be a pattern. Uh, and that would be something we look at. Um, and these are just some examples of the sort of characteristics of misconduct we look at to determine severity. Uh, the last one I have there is the age and education of the applicant at the time of the misconduct. Um, the point being that, you know, when we see applicants who had incidents or issues when they were juveniles or minors, um, it's going to carry less weight uh, given a, that a certain amount of time has passed and they haven't engaged in further uh, misconduct. Um, 
Okay, uh, we can go to the next slide now. So what do we look for? Um, as evidence of rehabilitation, once we've sort of determined how severe the misconduct was and we feel like we have a decent idea of how to gauge the relative um, strength of the showing that the applicant must meet. Typically, and you know, I'm gonna use a lot of um, uh, attorney wiggle words like typically because in the moral character context, there are very few bright lines. Uh, every applicant is different. Every applicant is an individual, of course, and every file is different. The facts of, you know, two applicants may have DUIs. The facts of those DUIs are going to vary. Uh, there are just so many moving parts. It's hard to draw bright lines. That said, typically um, for any sort of misconduct uh, for which we're looking for a showing of rehabilitation, we're definitely um, going to look to see that there was no further misconduct following the misconduct we're discussing, right? Um, and acknowledgement of wrongdoing um, or candor, you know, particularly, you know, candor during the moral character determination process in the application, perhaps at an informal conference, uh, if that occurs or, you know, an applicant's responsiveness to uh, requests from the moral character investigators um, who do the bulk of uh, the work in terms of working up these, in, these background uh, checks and investigations. Um, that is going to suggest um, whether, you know, the applicant has really reflected on and accepted responsibility uh, for the act of misconduct that we're um, looking at. Um, and it goes a long way. Um, and when you look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these, uh, these files, um, you know, some patterns emerge and, um, you know, you can begin to see uh, certain elements that the court has instructed us to look for. Um, and they kind of emerge and, you know, it, it's often somebody is, has candor all the way through the process and you can sort of tell that they are uh, owning up uh, to whatever occurred. Um, and then restitution I have there. Um, restitution, of course, if there's some legal requirement, restitution that's part of a criminal sentencing, that certainly uh, should be fulfilled. Um, they should meet that obligation. But I really mean restitution here more broadly uh, to mean some sort of repairing, giving back, making amends uh, to the person, entity, organization, community um, that was harmed by the misconduct. Um, so those are typically three things that often um, are part of a showing of rehabilitation. Um, some other evidence that we often see um, and the court has discuss discussed to some degree are character references. Um, people submit character reference letters. Um, when people uh, get into state bar court, uh, they'll have uh, witnesses testify on their behalf. Uh, the Supreme Court has said that character references alone are not sufficient uh, to show rehabilitation, but they can be very suggestive, um, particularly they are given great weight uh, when they come from members of the legal community, judges, attorneys, um, folks who presumably have some understanding of the um, ethical rigor uh, that it takes uh, to work in the legal profession. Um, and then this, also uh, the court wants the character references to know about the prior misconduct in the applicant's past. So, you know, there have been cases where uh, I might discuss one later a little, just briefly, uh, you know, where somebody might have had 20 or 30 character reference letters from fairly impressive individuals, uh, but none of them conveyed any understanding that they knew about the misconduct in the applicant's past. Uh, we would rather see the applicant had misconduct. Somebody currently is very familiar with the applicant, can vouch for their current moral character, even in light of the prior misconduct. Um, and attending college and law school. Um, again, not sufficient, clearly, but you know, suggest somebody is, has his or her life somewhat on track, hopefully during those years, no further acts of misconduct occur. 
And so I just sort of put those there as examples of, um, you know, you see some people who have repeated problems during a discrete period of their life and they kind of build themselves back up, they get back on track, get into school. Um, that might be something that uh, suggests rehabilitation. And then finally, I have their ethics school and client trust account school. Um, those are two day long, roughly classes that are offered by the state bar's office of chief trial counsel. Um, and their senior trial counsel uh, teach those classes. Um, ethics has obvious uh, relevance to rehabilitation. Uh, client trust account school is uh, quite important and useful. Um, a, a, uh, it is not uncommon uh, for discipline cases uh, when people do become licensed attorneys uh, to arise from the mishandling of client funds and specifically the rules and procedures around client trust accounts. So those are two, um, you know, we'll have applicants who will preemptively before they talk to us, uh, they will go and sign up and take those classes um, to demonstrate um, their rehabilitation. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to touch on, so that's kind of rehabilitation generally. Now I, I, I said, it, the, I talked about the proportionality. The court has discussed at some length cases in which there was serious, severe misconduct in the applicant's past. Um, and as you can imagine, the cases that make their way to the California Supreme Court and the ones in which the court grants review, uh, they tend not to be about minor uh, misconduct. So the court has had occasion to discuss these serious misconduct cases at some length. Um, and they have said, and by the way, it's somewhat question begging, but by serious misconduct, again, we're talking about acts that involve moral turpitude or reflect particularly poorly on a particular characteristic that is crucial uh, to the ethical practice of law. Um, when there is serious misconduct, the court requires a truly compelling demonstration of rehabilitation. Uh, it's used language like truly compelling, overwhelming proof of reform, clear and convincing evidence. Um, the, the court has actually analogized somewhat between uh, somebody who's seeking admission and uh, an attorney who's been disbarred and is seeking reinstatement. And, you know, while there are differences between those cases, the burden of proof, for example, um, there, uh, I'm sorry, that would be a discipline case. The reinstatement case and the, uh, it, it, the admission case are not that different, but in either case, they, the applicant or the petitioner really needs to show that they have fully come back from this serious misconduct. It's, it's a steep hill to climb. Um, it can be done um, and it's done, not infrequently, um, but it requires, uh, it, it requires some uh, significant rehabilitative activities on the part of the applicant. Um, the court has said that in general, in moral character proceedings and determinations, the process, uh, when there are equally plausible factual scenarios, for example, the applicant, we give the applicant the benefit of the doubt. You know, we're going in um, assuming the applicant is being honest with us, um, and we generally give the applicant the benefit of the doubt uh, when something could go either way. When there's serious misconduct, however, the court has noted that that's less easy to do, and uh, we should do it less. Uh, it's harder to draw positive inferences um, about any sort of factual scenario or assertion by an applicant following serious misconduct. So uh, that, there's a little bit of a, uh, not a burden shift, but there's a little shift there in uh, the standard of evidence uh, that must be produced. Um, and then this is one of the key phrases uh, in the rehabilitation area when there's been an act of serious misconduct, uh, the applicant must have a substantial period of exemplary conduct following the misconduct. Um, and that raises a couple of obvious questions. Uh, what does substantial mean? Uh, and what does exemplary mean? Uh, those are two of the first questions I had when I saw that 
phrase. Um, and well, first the substantial period, I, I should say the court has noted, and this has come up in several big cases, um, big decisions, that the rehabilitative period of time, the time after the serious misconduct during which the applicant should not engage in any further misconduct, should affirmatively uh, do some rehabilitative activities um, and will get credit uh, in the rehabilitation analysis for a period of time. That time begins after the misconduct ends, seems fairly obvious, and then up until the moral character process begins. Now, it's not that we don't care how the applicant acts and the conduct uh, in which the applicant engages during the moral character process. It's just that the court has said when an applicant is under the scrutiny of the state bar and obviously is well aware of that, um, good behavior, if you will, uh, carries less weight. Uh, similarly, we would subtract from that time period any period of that time period during which the applicant was under community supervision of some sort, parole, probation, for a similar reason. Uh, when somebody is being supervised by the court, probation department, et cetera, uh, he or she is required uh, and will uh, suffer personal <laughs> um, consequences um, if they don't uh, follow the terms of that supervision. Um, so that's the time period the court's looking for. Now, what does substantial mean? I can tell you, and again, I, you know, this always makes me nervous because I, I always wanna go back and say no bright lines, which is true. But if you look at the series of cases from the California Supreme Court um, and uh, the cases, you know, that have been litigated by the Office of uh, Chief Trial Counsel uh, by um, the Office of General Counsel in the Supreme Court. Um, generally, when there's serious misconduct, about between six and eight years rehabilitative period is roughly um, where, where the court has come down in terms of approving the period of time. No bright lines, but that gives you some idea. Um, exemplary conduct. The court has said that it, by exemplary, it means, first of all, it, the, the conduct must include, I discussed restitution before, this is sort of a stronger showing of that. It, there has to be some sort of giving back to the community that was harmed, um, you know, or doing something affirmative to help the community that was harmed. So for example, uh, if somebody perhaps had an honor code violation in college, uh, they cheated, they plagiarized maybe. Um, they might go back and uh, give a talk um, to freshmen, uh, first year students in a writing course about their experience and how they messed up and how they've learned and um, things of that nature. Yeah, it's just one example. Um, and so yes, a substantial period of exemplary conduct is what we're looking for uh, when there's been serious misconduct. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to add on. So with the exemplary conduct, um, we do also, we mentioned on the website as well that just ordinary behaviors such as holding a steady job, um, abiding by the law, getting married, starting a family, that those do not constitute exemplary behavior. So that's definitely not what we're looking for when there are serious acts of misconduct in someone's background. Yeah, thank you, Tara. Um, that is certainly the case. Um, you know, it's great. Uh, you know, those things, uh, perhaps in the specific context of a specific applicant, um, the facts around the applicant starting a family or having employment, may have some relevance, um, but as Tara points out, um, those are really not unusually um, affirmatively good things to do. They're sort of more typical, and so they don't carry a lot of weight. Um, okay, that was a very brief overview of the rehabilitation requirement um, that applicants um, face um, in moral character determinations. Uh, let me quickly give you a couple examples 
uh, and then you can ask me questions if you like. Uh, the first one's from 1995 in Ray Mena. Uh, this is one of the big, uh, more recent cases in the last uh, couple decades in, um, in the Supreme Court. And this was an applicant who had previously been disbarred in New Jersey uh, for among other things, uh, theft of client funds. That's not good. Uh, felonies, in fact. Um, he also failed to file uh, income taxes, uh, manufactured uh, methamphetamine. Um, he had a compulsive gambling problem that, um, you know, contributed to his other problems. Uh, and then he engaged in excessive alcohol use that also contributed uh, to his problems. Um, now, this was an applicant who the committee of bar examiners declined to grant the positive moral character determination. However, uh, when the applicant appealed to state bar court, that decision was reversed. Um, the committee then appealed that decision to the California Supreme Court, which reversed again, in other words, agreeing with the committee and not admitting the applicant. Now, what did the applicant offer in mitigation? Uh, sorry, mitigation, rehabilitation. He had uh, done, he had gotten psychiatric treatment, um, not only for his compulsive gambling issue, but some other issues he had been having, personal issues. He submitted about 30 character references, uh, letters I, um, and witnesses, live witnesses eventually. Um, and it had been about five and a half years since the last serious act of misconduct that he had had, the sort of significant mis misconduct uh, that the court was looking at. Uh, the court pointed out, however, though, that he had made little effort to repay, you know, for example, his clients and some gambling debts, I believe. Uh, and the court said, given the, you know, significance of the prior misconduct, uh, five and a half years simply didn't cut it, was not enough. Uh, that's in Ray Mena. Um, the next one is, uh, if you go to the next slide, it's in Ray Gossage. Um, well, it'll come along uh, or not, but I will uh, let you know about it either way. In Ray Gossage. So this was a case in 2000, another California Supreme Court case. Uh, and in this case, this applicant, again, had very serious misconduct, uh, felony forgery conviction, um, significant drug abuse. Uh, he had a voluntary manslaughter conviction um, for killing his sister. Um, he had multiple DUIs, uh, drug possession, and um, on top of all of that, he submitted an incomplete application uh, when he sought to become an attorney in California. Um, so that's a lack of candor uh, and a failure to disclose relevant information. Um, he did offer evidence that he was rehabilitated. And this case uh, is, was in a similar procedural posture as the last one I spoke of in Ray Mena, in that the CBE initially uh, declined uh, to grant a positive determination uh, to this applicant and the California Supreme Court eventually agreed uh, with the CBE. Um, now, Mr. Gossage did demonstrate through evidence that he had uh, engaged in community service. He had worked on a bunch of political campaigns. Uh, he had expert testimony, actually, uh, sort of mental health testimony about his current character. Um, 20 some uh, character reference witnesses and nine and a half years um, since the serious misconduct. Uh, but the last bullet point there uh, sort of uh, gives away the, the punchline. Um, it had been nine and a half years is a significant amount of time. That may have done it. Um, and he had, you know, a lot of character references, uh, some of them attorneys. Um, they carried uh, some weight. Um, but he had had a series, and this goes back actually to uh, the, the example that came to mind. Uh, about a series of misdemeanors. That's what happened here. Uh, his serious misconduct ended at some point, but then he kept having 
less significant, uh, you know, traffic violations that turned into misdemeanors, uh, failures to appear, things of that nature. And in fact, he had had one of these six months prior to submitting his application, his moral character application. Um, and so the court decided that, you know, given the totality of the circumstances, which is a phrase I should use here, you know, um, the, that is really what the court's looking at. Uh, the totality of the circumstances, um, the court said it just was not enough uh, and declined um, to admit that applicant. Um, now, um, hopefully, if I still have your attention, you're wondering if I'll tell you about a case where the applicant succeeded, and that's what I'm going to do now. The next case, if you go to the next slide, yes, uh, Pacheco uh, versus um, the State Bar, uh, this was a case in 1987 in which the applicant was a former CHP officer. Um, he had committed some misconduct um, in that job. Um, not the sort of extraordinary misconduct um, uh, that we've seen lately in the news, but misconduct mishandling evidence, uh, improperly storing evidence, things of that nature. Um, he also engaged in some sort of uh, suspect loan practices, some shady loan practices. And he, um, this is important, he had previously been denied uh, a positive moral, moral character determination. And so he had reapplied um, and he had not been entirely candid during the prior proceedings. Um, now, the court noted that he had 20 character references and these witnesses, um, this is one of those cases where the court emphasized the fact that the witnesses really seemed to know about the misconduct. Um, and so those carried more weight. Um, the court also highlighted the fact that Mr. Pacheco had been a private investigator, a licensed private investigator for 10 years without a single allegation of misconduct. In that role, he had engaged in a community service, done community projects, um, and it had been about seven years since his last significant misconduct. Um, you know, when you look at bullet points in these cases, you might say, well, what's the difference between this case and the last case? But you really have to drill down. You have to look at each piece of rehabilitation evidence that the applicant offers, and you have to assess how much weight that evidence should carry. Were there character reference letters? How many were there, or witnesses? How many were there? Who were they? Were any of them from the legal profession? Did they acknowledge that the applicant had engaged in misconduct? You know, that sort of thing. And when you look at those factual differences, they explain um, the differences in the outcomes of these cases. Uh, there are a lot of other cases, of course, um, but I'm gonna stop there. Um, that was kind of a quick overview, uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, the committee members might have. I, I have questions, uh, but I'll give somebody else the opportunity if they deem so. I'll jump in. I'll jump in there then. Uh, just to say that was, that was a great presentation, David. Oh, uh, well, uh, thank you, Dolores. A lot of information and uh, well presented in a, in a very uh, concise time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, it wasn't easy being last on the agenda when we were all in the same room. <laughs> but we, we uh, insist on holding your attention. Okay, um, David, thanks. I, I really, really, really appreciate that presentation. And I also appreciate uh, the chair and the state bar staff for bringing more of these trainings for us so we could get a deeper understanding of uh, these multi-layered and very complex issues that come before us. Um, my my um, comments are in regards to um, access to, so I guess this is something that I've explored as we've gone into the uh, pandemic is about the additional barriers that we place on rehabbed felons and those um, that are uh, 
previously incarcerated. So I guess what I'm looking to explore is like, what are the, um, the limitations that, that we have as a state bar to um, really impose less restrictions on those who appear rehabilitated? I understand there's character statements, there's candor, and there's all those elements, but kind of what I'm, what I'm alluding to is that I, I believe there's sometimes unintended consequences when we um, provide additional barriers and we kind of pen additionally penalize as opposed to really honoring the whole rehabil rehabilitated individual. And what we're seeing statewide with Prop 17 was that, you know, the state is actually in a direction where we're looking for additional rights being, not additional, but civil rights being restored um, to um, felons and giving them the opportunity to have a voice and, and even voting. So um, what, what is your understanding of that? And what do you perceive our role in kind of understand and kind of participating in that discussion too? No, I really thank you, um, Kareem. I really appreciate that question. Um, and it really gets to one of the fundamental issues uh, in moral character determinations. And it goes back to the bright line thing I keep repeating, uh, that there are really very few bright lines. And this is an example. Um, when we see that somebody maybe has a felony conviction, they serve time in prison, um, we are not going to draw a conclusion from that fact. In fact, if anything, we are going to affirmatively check any sort of bias that, that might come up or we might feel. And then we are going to get the relevant facts that matter. And in fact, my colleagues have heard me say before that frankly, some of the most impressive applicants that I've met uh, in informal conferences are those who have had some of the most serious um, criminal background. Um, you know, of course, sometimes people uh, have a bad time and they continue to commit criminal acts, but sometimes people just have a discrete period of their life. They might serve some time in prison, but then they get out, they discover community service, they get involved in all sorts of organizations, helping other uh, recently uh, released um, incarcerated persons, um, you know, really impressive rehabilitative activities. So I, 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 I'm getting a little off track uh, from your question, but I just wanna make the point that yes, we consider it when we see a felony conviction, that's going to be something that we definitely take notice of but it's not, we are, we, we intentionally don't draw any immediate conclusions just by a superficial fact like that. Uh, we want to drill down and uh, get all of the relevant information. I, I hope that, and I don't know if Tara might have something to add. I hope that sort of addressed your question. Yep, I was trying to, yeah, I, I just oh, wanted to add. I think for that, me, um, it's about like, are we making them do like two years worth of additional reformation that cost tens of thousands of dollars you know what i mean i think those but i've been in moral character hearings with you and i know that's the case i know that that's the line that we have where we're i mean we're, we're very progressive in that aspect i guess i'm just trying to showcase that um as the state bar has some critique that we we are about rehabilitation and, and bringing more people into the bar so i guess i'm trying to point it in that direction but Tara, go ahead. I would love to hear more. Of course. Um, sorry about that. I know the Zoom, the talking over each other gets tough. Um, I just wanted to point out as well that with the Moral Character Working Group, that was definitely one of the focuses was ensuring that rehabilitation is taken into um, correct consideration, ex especially given the societal standards. So that was in mind definitely when we revised the statement and guidelines. Thank you both. Uh, I really appreciate both of, uh, both of your work. David, that was a great presentation, and I hope we get to learn more because um, this is really a big, um, a big task that we have um, as committee of bar examiners, and we 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 literally change people's lives um, when we approve these um, rehab rehabbed uh, felons or people formerly incarcerated. We we literally um, have the ability to really reform communities, 
just by giving them access and representation. So I really appreciate the work both of you do. So thank Thank you, Kareem. And, and that is absolutely the, the case. Um, and, and that's why I, I am, uh, I think it's important and I like what I started with, which is that in California, we don't disqualify you for any, per se, for any act of misconduct. Okay, thanks David and Tara for the questions and answers and the presentation. Um, moving on to the goals with Bethany. Okay, so since we are at the end of our year, um, most of our goals are pretty resolved. Um, and it's my understanding that our next meeting in January, we'll be creating new goals for the next year. So um, we just took care of number one right now. Thank you, David. Um, number two, we're getting a presentation on the lawyer assistance program in March. And then the others are um, ongoing. So unless anyone has any questions or comments, I'll um, ask for a motion to approve our 2020-2021 goals. So moved. All right, I can. Moved. and seconded by Alex. Dr. Bolton. Judge Brody. Yes. Dr. Kao. Yes. Mr. Chen. Mr. Efting. Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Isari? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pick? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Judge Toriaba? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. So this concludes our open session. For all the committee members, please leave this room and go to the closed session that you should have received by now. And um, for all the public members that are watching this, we will come back once we adjourn the closed session meeting. Thank you. We're back in open session. Our closed session concluded, our meeting business has concluded. And unless anyone has any more business that wants to be discussed,
then the meeting is adjourned. Hearing Thank no you. one. Happy holidays, everybody. Just Happy everyone. holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye. Well, see you next month. Happy holidays. We'll see you soon. See you next year. Bye. Bye.